We're using time trying to save time for more people to join the session. Yeah, so if you know anyone that should be here, um, this is the link. I just missed the link on the chat. Please help us post, send to them to join the masterclass. You may know that registered, but might have forgotten to join the session. Please remind them that we have started. And when, when, we, when we begin, when we go in fully, we're not going to slow it down at all. Um, so before we begin, just drop a chat. Let's know where you're coming in from. Drop your chat. Um, once I'll just give you some housekeeping rule. Our uh, facilitator is actually on the call. Her name is Faustine Namsenda, and she's ready to start off with great speed. Um, so once we start and you have a question that is directed to her, um, please raise up your hand. You use the raised hand icon and ask your question. She'll be able to respond to you. It's going to be a very, very interactive session. It's going to be hands on. So use the opportunity well. Um, remember to tweet the nuggets you learn using the hashtag Women Texas Masterclass and tweet at Tech for Deaf HQ. You just look out for the chats. Very soon you see the procedure and our social media handles to follow. The Women Texas Masterclass is not just um, a one off um, session. We have a series of training programs facilitated by skilled professionals across different sectors and tailored towards equipping women like yourself with digital skills. And it's very, very immersive. It's an online experience that allows you to learn directly from a professional in the field. And we're lucky to have Faustine Namsenda. She's a professional in this um, field. She's been doing it for some while. Yeah, success. Nice seeing you. Please introduce yourself via the chat. Just drop where you're, you're joining us from. And like I said, remember to share the link. So more women in the software development field, you know, women that have entry-level job roles or uh, aspiring to become full-time software engineers that are not yet on the call, please try and send the links to them. We would appreciate it so they can join the meeting. Through this software development masterclass, you acquire in-depth and practical knowledge of building solid, building scalable applications using solid principles. I hope you're excited as I am to learn what that means. I know some of you might have had an idea, but um, Faustine is going to do a good job delivering a very, very, very in-depth session. Faustine, I'm saying that I'll be mentioning her name. She's a software engineer at Microsoft ADC Kenya. She holds a BSc in computer science. She's graduated from Kenyatta University in Nairobi. Um, she's been a software developer for the past three years, and her expertise began in the Java programming language. She's a software engineer currently working for Microsoft at the African Development Center, like I mentioned earlier. Her task is majorly centered around Azure Microsoft Cloud Solution, where she helps in doing deployment, maintenance, and dealing with customer reported and upcoming incidents at the host level. Apart from what she does, development of tools that will use to automate tax on the cloud as more of the things she also do. Before she joined Microsoft, she has worked at a utility company that majored in providing software solutions to gas and utility companies. This is a B2B outfit. She likes studying and learning new things, be it in technology related or otherwise. And aside from work, Faustina has a she Faustina has a, a fun side to her. She likes working out, dancing and reading books. And she's also a mom to a 10-month-old daughter. Hi, Faustine. Let's get to put a face to this name. Good morning. Uh, uh, good morning. I'm just, I've just turned my camera on. Uh, sorry, uh, it's at the bottom. I'm sharing my screen. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I think it's not that clear. Let me put it on the side so that you can see. Yeah, yeah, I am. Uh, so excited to join you guys. Um, uh, it's a really, really good opportunity. Actually, this is my first ever masterclass session. So uh, so it's also a lot of learning from me, um, considering having to do these masterclasses in the future. So in case of anything, in case I'm not clear on, on, on anything, just feel free to go ahead and uh, raise your hand and ask. And I think there's someone who had their hand up and uh, they put it down. I don't know, maybe if their question has been answered or something. I think Ibrahim uh, hands was, was up for some time.
Um, Rania, I have given you the right to mute yourself. In case you have a question, please ask your question now. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it was an error. Please go ahead, first thing. Okay. <laughs> oh, I had this up again. Rania, you got to yeah. mute. <laughs> Please go ahead and unmute yourself, Rania. Okay, Faustin, I think someone is, you know, maybe her yeah. child is, yeah, just uh, No problem. Um, so as, uh, as I've been introduced, I'm currently working for Microsoft, uh, the ADC office. At the Africa Development Office, the Nairobi branch of it, and um, I'm 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 the actually our team is called the base team. So the way you see Azure, there are those let's say nodes or computers that are on the lower level that we build virtualization on top of them so that you can be able to provide um, the cloud solutions that people get. So for me, our task is now on supporting the actual lower level hosts so that we can build virtualization on top of them uh, for them to provide services to customers. So generally as, uh, as a software engineer, um, uh, my work is generally centered around ensuring that you see the way you have to update and, and, and keep your computer up to date. The same thing has to happen on Azure. It has to have the latest security features. It has to have the latest operating system and um, everything. The way you keep up with the technology on the outside world, also the technology in the cloud has to be the same. So my work daily is to ensure that we have the latest technology, the latest operating system. And this involves, can you imagine, like I, I deal with the compute side like of, of things, you know, as you know, the cloud, there's compute, there's storage, and then there's networking. So we deal with the compute side of things. That is generally actually what you use as when you go to the cloud and fire up a Windows uh, computer, that is now what you use on the compute side. So we, we support all the compute nodes that are on the Azure fleet. So you can imagine you're dealing with billions of nodes. Uh, so generally that is that. And then we also have to do uh, a lot of development in terms of tools that can help you uh, automate a lot of these tasks. So if you maybe notice that whatever you do is a task that you have to do over and over again. So uh, the idea or the motivation is that you just sit down and think, like, if I do this thing over and over again, what can I do? What script can I write? What tool can I come up with that can be able to help me uh, automate these processes so that I don't have to actually be there all the time doing these tasks? So we also leverage on that. You, We sit down, we come up with tools, we develop tools that we use in-house also. So that is also another um task that also falls under my plate in my day-to-day -day work at, at Microsoft. Uh, the other thing also is that now as a customer, when you're using Azure, there, there are other issues that you come up with because with you, you know with every software solution, they, there's always um, uh, incidents that happen. Maybe someone's computer is down, maybe someone's network is slowing down. There's some critical customers that they, are, they always have to be up no matter what. So that is also another thing that we usually deal with. Um, we, 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 we have support also for customers in their the issues that they come up with daily. So in Azure, we also have to provide, um, you have to always have to make sure that you meet the service level agreements that you have with your customer. So I also deal with incidences. You do support investigative issues. You investigate what is the problem with a particular node or a computer or, or a virtual machine. And then you, you have to come up with a solution and also a report to the customer as to why maybe a certain service went down and what is the progress on it or will it ever happen again or is it something that is one off? Yeah. So generally, that is what happens when we when we are on my level at Microsoft. I haven't been a software engineer that long, as as you can see from my uh, portfolio. I started uh, software engineering like three months, uh, three years, sorry, ago. Um, despite the fact that I I finished campus a very long time ago. Uh, issue being that I started develop. I started having the interest of doing software development later on, even though I did computer science. So my interest was mostly on databases initially. And then I eventually I actually started having some interest in software engineering. And then I started with Java, um, learned 
through everything I, I learned myself and then went, tried looking for a job, got my first job as a software engineer. And then from that first job, I stayed there for one year, the, the company that was providing the utility services. And then after that, that is when I, I shifted to Microsoft. So that tells you like a lot uh, of the things that you're going to achieve or, or, or get is through you learning for yourself. Like a lot of the of the task, uh, of the technology that you feel that you are you you you're interested towards just go ahead and start learn look for opportunities try to see what people do out there and sometimes also um that there are those things that maybe when you're looking for a job or you're still in campus you always tell yourself oh, i wish i knew about these things i wish i knew the market looks for this and and all that yeah so i hope that these master classes will be an opportunity for you guys to also learn like what are the tools that you need to keep equip yourself for you to be able to leverage and get uh these jobs and 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 whatever uh issue that you want to uh, or place that you want to go in your life yeah Yeah, so that's all from me as an introduction. Thank you so much, Christine. I think you can just go straight in into the training. Let's let's yeah. begin. Okay. Um, let me share my screen first. So, I are you able to see my screen? Yes, you can turn off your video now to save. Um, yeah. But your screen okay. is actually your video is actually pinned. Can you pin your screen? Okay, great. Yeah, you can go ahead now. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So you can uh, you can see my screen now. Yeah. You can yeah. view full screen view from beginning. Mm. Is it not from the beginning? Um, yeah. Click on from beginning. Yeah, it is from. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Thank yeah. you. Okay. Uh, so as as I was in, uh, as we said today, we are going to look at how we can be able to build scalable applications uh, with the solid principles. Um, and before I even start on the on on, on this topic, as you ca as you have seen, scalability is a very uh, it's a it's a very huge concern when it comes to application development. Even um, for for those of you who have maybe gone to a lot of these interview interviews with these a lot of these corporates, you find that one of the questions that will be asked during the interview is is on the segment of system design, and on system design they always center a lot of their questions around scalability uh, because scalability has become a, a, a concern for a lot of them. Uh, application developers nowadays because you start maybe with your application you start small and then as your application gets out there they, it gets to the market it blows up so you end up having a lot of people or a, a lot of compute uh, a lot of hardware or a lot of softwares or a lot of users who are depending or using your application and maybe when you were creating this application from the beginning you did not expect the amount of growth growth or popularity that it has gained so you end up sitting down and thinking oh so what do we do how do we accommodate uh this success or how do we accommodate this number of users or new softwares or hardwares that are now depending on our application so you start thinking on how you can be able to go ahead and do and scale your application so nowadays it is important like that as a as a programmer or a software engineer or software developer that whatever you do you have scalability in mind you ask yourself so what if I'm starting small and then in the future I end up getting a million users or even a billion users will my application sustain this number of users will i be able to provide the same service the same user experience the same uh even the same layout let's say if my application has one user or in the event that it has one billion users will the experience with it be the same so this is what's now what scalability is all about you need to be thinking about this 
these issues when you're even developing our application from the beginning. We don't start thinking about scalability when, oh God, we, we now have a billion users. What now? What do we do? That is now when we start thinking about it. So we think about scalability even at the lower level. When you're starting to build an application, we have scalability in mind. So that is that is what we are going to talk about. Like the contents of this class will just be about, uh, we'll do an introduction to scalability, what it is all about, and then we do an introduction to the basic principles of object-oriented programming. Because when you go to the solid principle, you need you need to have knowledge about the basic principles of object-oriented programming for you to be able to understand what solid principle is all so solid principles are all about. Because those principles they rely on the basic principles of object-oriented programming. So that is why we will have an introduction to those principles and then we go to the solid principles. So for the examples in this uh, course, I've used Java. Uh, so if you are a developer in another language, you just, the, the principles are just the same. It's only that the language is different because if you are a developer in an object-oriented language, uh, if you're talking about inheritance, if you're talking about encapsulation or any of those, it means that the same way you apply in Java, you can al also apply it in, uh, in the language that you're conversant with. Yeah, so uh, with that, let's go, sorry. And then the objectives of this class is just, I just uh, want programmers or software developers or whoever, even system designers that are in this uh, class, for them to be able to know how you can be able to leverage solid principles uh, in your programming practices so that we can be able to create more readable, uh, thoroughly tested and maintainable code. Yeah, so with, if we develop with the solid principles in mind, our code will be more readable, it will be uh, very maintainable, like as another person who wasn't there when we were writing it can be able to actually understand what is going on and they can be able to maintain it. We don't actually have to be there for our code to be maintainable. And then it will also ensure that we actually test our 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 pre processes uh, well before we go ahead and release uh, applications or anything to the public. Yeah. So uh, let's start with first of all what we mean by application scalability. So um, scalability is just the ability of your application to handle a growing number of customers, clients, or users. So as you know, you, you can build an application that is dealing with customers. It can be dealing with clients. By clients, we can, we can, it can be dealing with web servers. It can be dealing with an, other applications. And or you can, we can actually be dealing with actual users. So um, what, what we, are, we are talking about is that if... Is your, is your application behaving the same if it is maybe dealing with a, 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 a number of 10 users and 1 billion users? Like, are we able to see a difference if your application is, is dealing with fewer users as compared to many users? So your application should be able to provide the same experience regardless of the number of users that it is using or more or less the same experience. So... Um, so it is directly related to the ability of your current or future developer to maintain the application and its data consistency. By data cost, your, your, your application, the way your application looks, the experience should be the same. And by data consistency, we mean like your data, no matter where it is, should be consistent. Like even if, even if you have maybe multiple tables that are hosted in different places, if I am accessing uh, data about myself here, for example, here in Kenya, and then I get this particular amount of data. Maybe uh, my, the database is hosted in a geographical region that is near Kenya. And then I travel tomorrow to another country, say Nigeria, and then I try to access the data. And then it is hosted in another geographical region. Whatever data I get when I am in Kenya should be the same data I get if I'm in Ni Nigeria, despite the fact that maybe my data is hosted in different places. So that is what we mean by data consistency. So as our application is growing, we are just not worried about the user experience. So scalability, we also have consistency in mind, like is our data consistent to every user or the same user, no matter where they are. They, they are. Okay, so when we have scalability in our application, it, it is a guarantee that our, our application will be able to sustain a high growth of its user base. Like no matter how many uh, people uh, or clients or users are going to use our application, our application can be able to sustain and maintain them. So 
to do this, your application from the beginning should be correctly configured. So you should, this means that the right software protocols should be there, like your hardware should be aligned maybe to meet the high number of the requests that you get. So with scalability, it's not only about also the application that you get, sometimes some of these issues they have to do, to do with your hardware. So you have to optim optimize both your software is scalable and also your hardware also has to be able to uh, maintain the high number of users that you're going to get. So uh, each user interaction when using your application generates a request and making sure that each request is attended is a must. So no matter how many users you have, even if let's say you, you hit a billion users, it means that if you get a billion requests from these users, each request has to be attended to. So that is also another um, issue or something you have to deal with when you're dealing with scalability. So for example, you can decide to do this for you to be able to achieve scalable applications. You can decide to increase your computing processing capacity. Uh, you can say you, you're going to hire a flexible web service provider. So this will also allow you, you can always add capacity the, the, the way you want. So with scalability, there are two ways in which you can maybe decide to scale. There's vertical scalability, and then there is horizontal scalability. That is when it comes to the issue of hardware. Like right now, I have a, a lot of users who are using my, my service. I decide, oh, I'm going to add more computer um, RAM, more computer processing power, and all that. So when you decide, let's say, I'm going to add more computer RAM, more computer processing power, and, and all that, that is vertical scalability. You decide I'm going to throw all my money in whatever I have in my in my computer right now and get the top line and and then make sure that it can be able to handle all these requests that I that I have. That is vertical scalability. But the issue with vertical scalability is that there's so much that you can do. Maybe you can either run out of funds or the technology that you require to support your user base has not yet been invented. So there's always a ceiling. So that is why. The, now we have the horizontal scalability coming in. So with the horizontal scalability, you can decide instead of me going for the uh, top market computer in the market and all that, I can use this cash and maybe buy 10 servers or I can buy 20 servers and then I try and distribute my workload on these several servers and then all of them can be can work on whatever requests I have. So you can decide to go that way. You can either decide to go with vertical scalability or horizontal scalability. So uh, the other issues of scalability that we have nowadays of hardware, you can also decide to go the cloud way. Like you can come to Microsoft, for example, and tell us my, use, my, my base is growing. Uh, I need you to guys to try and maintain or uh, deal with my, my skill. And then your service provider can go ahead and, and, and increase your hardware, your software, or, or anything depending on the number of users that you get, and then maybe reduce them when you no longer have these many users. So there's so many ways that you can decide to go when it when it comes to the route of scalability. So now that is on the application scalability. Okay. So why why do we why does scalability matter? Um you going ahead and sitting down and coming up with a mobile application or a web application, it's an extensive process. So when you start from a fresh idea, you go ahead and introduce your market product, you go through your ups and downs. So when you start, let's say you finished building your application successfully and then um, it reaches the saturation point. So you want your application to deliver the great experience that you, that you want it to to the users, no matter how many users they add. But you know, as the, your application grows, if for example, you have two, uh, the growth is too fast, you might have downtimes occurring all the time. So uh, for that now, it leads to issues. Maybe you'll have negative feedback from your users because maybe they all the time, or sometimes when they're trying to access your application, your application is down. Um, maybe the issues with, maybe the users cannot be able to access their resources wherever they want to and, and all that. So that is why you see scalability matters. So, because when you don't manage growth correctly, uh, your, your application or even the success of your company, let's say if you're a company owner, um, can, 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 can collapse because you need to anticipate, like if I'm starting with this, what will happen if I grow and, 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 and become successful or my product busts. Um, so some of the benefits that you, you start with building a, a scalable applications, as we know, you'll obviously maintain a good user experience uh, with your application. Let's say 
you have a thousand users and they are all happy about your, your your application, like you can be able to manage the user base, they can be able to access your application on time, they can be able maybe to download your application every time that they want to. So this leads to a good user experience and will continue growing your, the, your user base when it comes to your application. So for even the success of your application or your tool or whatever your giving out there it depends on how how you can guarantee your scalability um then there's another thing about you not being tied to the original developer so if your applications code is complicated like for example if you hired a developer or someone who wrote your applications code is the only person who can be able to understand it it will mean that you'll be tied to this person you'll be needing them every time you need to maintain the code anytime you need to do anything on the code base you'll be needing the original developer but if you focus on the scalability and your your code is readable and maintainable this means that you don't actually need the original person who came up with things to come and maintain that code because it will mean that the code is understandable anyone who can be able to read it can be able to understand the flow and know what how things work so this is also another good thing about writing scalable code because you will not be tied down to the original developer if anything happens to them or if they leave even your company and then when your application is scalable it means you have potential for growth so you're not you're not tied to a particular ceiling like this is how far we can be able to go we cannot break out of that it will mean that you can take as much as you as they come so you will have more potential and you'll get also positive user feedback because users are happy as long as they can be able to access the application and get it without any issues, they are good. So you see, you'll have potential for growth when you think about scalability, which will in turn lead to higher return on investment and feedback, uh, positive feedback from your from your users. So, um, so yes, it, it's easy to talk about this scalability and all that. So how do we determine if how do I determine if let, let's say my application is scalable? I've just started maybe, I don't actually know uh, how, how far my application will go. I don't even know how my user base will be. So how do I ensure that this application is scalable, even though I'm just starting now with maybe a capacity that I can be able to manage? So you should ask yourself this question. Uh, is your application's code structure and associated hardware as it stands today able to scale up uh, to exponential growth. So the way my code is, can it be able to scale? Can it be able to accommodate more and more, let's say users, can I come and plug more objects to this code without it breaking? Can I come and, and maybe uh, add more dependencies to my code base without it breaking? And also with the associated hardware, like the servers that I'm using to host uh, my application or something, the servers uh, to look to um, look at requests and everything, can they be able to sustain? Let's say if tomorrow I wake up and have a million users and all of them are sending requests to my web server, can it be able to sustain that growth? So these these are the questions that we are, we ask ourselves so that we can be able to determine if our application is scalable. So if you have any doubts as to how big your application can grow, so you need to seriously consider. Uh, your application scalability issue. Um, so your application needs to be scalable from the start, way before it is launched to the public. And the only way to truly know if your application is uh, it can be able to handle uh, scalability is by extensive testing. So as you know, as developers, testing is also an integral part of our, of our development cycle. So we need to be able to test test our application with um, under the various loads and different things that we think it's going to face when it is actually released to the public. So the reason scalability set testing is necessary is that you need to know if your application can handle the enormous workloads ahead while avoiding costly glitches and constant updates. So we need to be able to know if we grow tomorrow, will we be able to uh, sustain the growth or will it, we will need to push a new update into the market. Uh, will we be able to, we go ahead and then tell our users now we are upgrading our services, we are upgrading our application so that you can be able to handle the, use, uh, the user base. So uh, we are using an analogy like, for example, imagine you taking a car to the market without testing how durable it is, how it performs, how it breaks works, or even its ability to take turns. So 
if the safety features weren't good enough to protect people in accidents, for example, if you haven't even tested something like that, like let's say you haven't even tested if your engine, uh, if the engine starts. So imagine going ahead and you say you're going to launch your your car and then you, you you try even to start it and your engine cannot even start in the showroom floor. So that means your brand has been tarnished. And as you can see, um, car manufacturers and people like that, they do extensive set, uh, testing because they care about their brand. They wouldn't want such things to happen. So also as application developers or as software developers or engineers, we also need to be thinking about such things. So we should think of our applications as working at the same way. So even if uh, your, your customers, they want all the benefits that your application uh, can, can have. Let's say you have a fancy application that can be able to achieve a lot. But if simple scalability and performance issues cannot be taken care of, it will mean people will be turned away from it. It can be uh, something that solves a lot of problems, but if tomorrow I wake up and I cannot be able to access the application or it is slow or something like that, something uh, such simple things that look trivial can actually turn your customers away from using your application. So, um, we have talked. We have we've talked about testing. So, what are the types of testings uh, can we do on applications to ensure that uh, we we have dealt with scalability? So, we have a kind of testing that is known as load testing. So, you intentionally put demand on your application through multiple requests, for example, so that you can be able to measure its response. So, you try to simulate what can happen in the real world. So, you you. Uh, we can say bombard your application with a lot of requests, a lot of um, uh, things, what can happen in the market and see what is this, how is it behaving? Is it able to reply on time? Is it able to do what is expected? Is the user even, the user experience the same? Some things, is, is, is the application even, uh, is, is even, let's say the graphical interface looking the same when we have bombarded it with like a million users at the same time? So load testing is, now how you can really know how your application is going to behave like in the real world because you're simulating what would happen in the real world. So um, so load tests are usually specifically designed to assess response times. Like you see, let's say, how, how much time does it take for my application to respond to certain requests and how, how much resource does it use? Um, because remember, we need to know, let's say, if even if we have all the hardware that you want in the world, uh, we need to know how much resource our, our, our application use, like even in terms of hardware resources, for us to be able to know how we can be able to scale. Let's say if, if it's data, data usage moves from uh, one GB to one TB in, in a second, if this number of users are there, we need to be able to know, oh, this is the resource that is being used, so we need to provide this one TB at this particular time. So load testing is what can be able to help us to see such things. So, and also load testing can also pinpoint where your application breaks. Let's say if your application is designed that maybe it cannot handle a million users, the moment you load test it, you load test it and then you have a million users, it will break. So that mean that will mean that you'll now be able to know, oh, okay, my application breaks at this point. So how do you fix that? So that is one way of doing scalability testing through load testing. And then we also have to do performance testing because we need to know what is the speed of our application, what is the response time, how stable is it, how reliable is it, is it scaling according to uh, what we, we expect it to and how much, resource, how much resource is it using. So we also need to do performance testing. So we, we with performance te testing, we just put it under a particular workload. So after we, we put our application under a particular workload and then we, we look and identify what are the performance bottlenecks do we have in our in our application? So maybe, for example, you notice uh, maybe if we put this amount of users, we are putting so much work on our web server. Uh, it's not performing according to how it's supposed to because maybe a lot of requests are going to it. So you can go ahead and think, oh, we can actually introduce multiple web servers so that can, they can be able to go ahead and, and look at these resources. So you see, when you introduce the multiple web servers, then you have, you, you, you have now scaled. You have distributed this workload on different hardwares uh, or different web servers. So you, you have improved on your performance. 
So through performance testing, that is now you can be able to sit down and see, oh, actually, we need to add this more. We need to, to, to maybe consider doing this at this particular place and all that. So when you're doing your performance testing, you focus on checking the software speed. Does it respond quickly? Because you know, as you know, users are concerned about speed. If your application is slow, uh, it it is it will provide a, a user experience that is not that good. And then scalability is also another thing. Um, how how much can we handle before we break? So scalability also we determine how, what is the maximum user load that we that we have be, before we break or before our application starts performing poorly. And then stability. Uh, so is it stable enough under varying loads or would, is it that when you give it as a particular load, our application now starts behaving uh, in, a, in another way that it's not supposed to be to behave. So we also uh, look at how stable our application is. So that is on the performance testing and then now the scalab uh, scalability testing. So uh, you just center around how scalable is your application? So you just check if I have this number of users, how is my performance affected? And then how can I be able to improve on it? So let's say you decide, uh, let's say you have taken a, a cloud service provider and then you just tell them, if I reach a million users, increase the number of, of web services that, um, that are supposed to look at those requests. So maybe if I'm the moment a million users are, are reached, your, your cloud service provider gives you more web services and then your customer's experience remains the same no matter how many users are there. So that is just that you determine what is your breaking point or where does your application reach and then you stop scaling any further and then what can we be able to, to do so that we can help it to scale any further. So um, those are the things that you can be able to do. You go ahead and just test it with a lot of load, you look at the performance, what performance is it, and then you look at the scalability, how scalable is my application. And then how do you prevent the scalability issues coming from the beginning, uh, coming later on in application development? So the goal is just you plan from the beginning. So before you even start the development phase of the application, be prepared to answer these questions. How many users are you expecting to use your application, let's say within an year, and then, do you have a flexible data storage plan? How long can all your customers fit in one server? Let's say when you're starting, you just have one server, and then uh, you ask yourself now, now that I'm starting with this one server, how long can I be able to maintain people in this single server? So in the future, what will I do if, if the number of people that are being served my application increase? And then what can you do when you have more customers or data? than that. Like what I have right now, yes, I can be able to maintain and manage it. So what if I double this by 10 times? Will I be able to maintain it? Will I be able to manage it? And then if not, what plans do I have? So by assuring that your application is fully scalable from the beginning, you'll be able to absorb exponential growth with a minimum downtime. So while you're also prioritizing user experience, because remember the goal is our user or the user of your application should not know that maybe you, they should not be bothered by the number of other users that are using your application. So it doesn't mean that, let's say, if you hit a billion users, the user experience should change. Every user should be able to experience the application as though they were the only person who was, who, who are using your application. So here the point is you just plan from the beginning, no matter what you should ask yourself those questions. Now, uh, what, what if, what if this happens, will my application be able to handle it? So for your application success, scalability is a crucial part of it. So let's say if when you're a mobile or a, uh, your, your mobile app or your web app is scalable, it can accommodate growth, it can provide good user experience for new users, and it will get you a better return on investment in the long in the long run. So if you want to serve thousands or even millions with your application, you need to plan for it from the beginning. So if you think like whatever you're releasing out there will have the possibility of growing into thousands, millions or even billions of users, you should be able to think about scalability when you're even starting. So uh, the ultimate purpose of testing when you're doing scalability testing is to push the current application beyond its saturation point so that you can be able to know what weaknesses you have. Then your team can then pinpoint that crucial moment, like when, when you have your, bre your breaking point, then you reverse engineer the problem. You try to see now, now this is my breaking point. Where What can I do to be able to improve on it? And then you work on improving on it. And then so make your application generally scalable and functional. And on this 
uh, points I think up to here when it comes to scalability. Like, for example, even when you're, uh, as I said initially, when you're joining a lot of these, uh, you'll find that when you want going for these entry level interviews, when it comes to, let's say, software engineer, software developer, and let's say system design, you'll be asked a lot of, you'll be asked on uh, these questions on system design. Like, how do you plan for, let's say you, you'll be given a, a scenario, maybe come up with an application that does A, B, C, D, and then your interviewer would like to see your, your thought process. And then how they will ask you now, how will you handle scalability? How will your application work under these particular uh, uh, under these particular circumstances? What do you have in mind? So most of these interview questions or all that, you'll find that they want to see if you have scalability in mind. Like if you if you're oriented from the beginning, if I'm developing this, uh, I should think, what if something happens in the future? What if this application goes and blows up? What measures do we have in place for us to be able to handle that? So yeah, so reading on scalability, understanding it, understanding what to do is also another crucial part for you to nail um, an entry level, not even an entry level, even for higher, uh, uh, even for senior software engineering interview questions. Yeah, so um, I think with that, you're done with the introduction to scalability. I think I'm going to pause here and uh, take in questions in case people have questions before we go to the basic principles of object-oriented programming. Any questions? Uh, I can't see if people have their hands up. Um, let me check. Um, Dorothy, go ahead. Go ahead and ask your question. Having yeah, a you can just, Yeah. You can also drop your questions in the chat. Dorothy, uh, please ask hi. your question. Can I be heard, please? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so um, my question is on the um, scalability. Yes. Um, uh, provided you work with a, a company that uh, works with um, works with a faster um, request or develops request within three days, or brings a, an application to be developed within three days for customers to use, right? Now okay. the, applica the application already has um, a limited timeline for you yeah. to for the developer to um, develop and then push to production for customers to use. The the issue is that uh, because of the the tight timelines, it becomes difficult for um, the developer to even even think about the scalability. So uh, my question is: once um, the application has been developed. Is there a way that we can still uh, make sure that it's, it's developed within the three days timeline, but yet um, it's very sc uh, scalable? Yes. Yes, actually there is. And that is what we are going to look at in our next section. Uh, generally, we, we, we are going to look at how now to be able to do your scalability on the low level in terms of even the classes that you come up with the methods that you write, uh, the, the principles that you use when you're doing a development, how scalable are they? So that is on the on the software side, like as a developer, when you're writing code, um, what things do you put in mind, like in terms of what ki the kinds of classes you write, the inheritance or the relationships that your classes have, how tightly coupled are they or, or anything like that? So that is on the development side of things. But let's say, You've gone ahead and maybe you've developed your application and it is already um, it's already out there. Like you've said, maybe you have a three days uh, timeline, and then later on you come and think about let's uh, about um, scalability. One way to go about it, you can decide. You can go ahead and just look at the, your code base and refactor it. Um, you can refactor it while you're improving. Like you 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 go ahead and now see. If maybe you have the opportunity of releasing versions or updates to that particular software, so during your version or during your updates, you now go ahead and keep on releasing more improved 
software, like software that is now thinking about scalability. You can go ahead and start refactoring the classes that you you went ahead and wrote that maybe were not that scalable, and you go ahead and refactor them. That is, and, and release them in terms of updates. And actually, uh, that all even happens actually in our day-to-day life. Like even here at uh, in my current working place at Microsoft, sometimes you go ahead and you just look at a code base and you're like, oh, this one, uh, it needs a lot of uh, uh, cleaning up. So you go ahead and just clean, clean it up and make sure that it's up to standards before you even release in terms of versions. So you can also do that later. Uh, in terms of the hardware, let's say, as we have seen, you have the options of maybe, let's say you started your project, you are just thinking, maybe you are just, you put it in one server and all that. You can start thinking of things like now, how do we improve on the number of uh, hardware or software that are going to deal with our requests? So you can decide to add maybe uh, another web server. You can in, in, in introduce things like load balancers. As you know, a load balancer can be able to take care of your request and determine which server do I send this request to? Which one do I send this request to? Actually, you find that there's some people who you release your application out there and then you notice um, a lot of people are reading and they're not actually, fewer of them are writing. So you can decide, oh, I will take a lot of my servers maybe and dedicate them to read operations. And then I, I take a fewer number of them and dedicate them to write operations, for example, so that people who are reading, they can be able to get their response faster. And maybe people who are writing can, yeah, they can maybe, they, they can take a few minutes when they are uploading their incidents. They won't mind as compared to someone who's reading and they're not getting whatever they want faster. So uh, such scalability can also be thought in future. So sometimes if maybe whatever you developed was not scalable at the at the point of development, you can actually go ahead and improve it to be scalable later. Uh, did I answer that? <laughs> yes, please. Thank you very much. Okay, no problem. Any other person? Uh, hi. Hi. Yeah. Um. I would like to ask, um, since you mentioned um, hardware scalability as well as software scalability on the lower level, I just want to find out, during development, are there any specific tools as a developer that you can use to check, to test the scalability before you push to production to like measure performance and things like that before pushing to production in your like development environment yeah um i think on the on the in the development environments like even the examples that i'm going to share with you here you can actually maybe write java like on my end in terms of java you can use the unit to write java tests and then these tests are, are going to maybe determine if Whatever you've written as your scalable code, is it meeting the requirements or what you want to achieve for your general application? You can go ahead and, and maybe test on that. But there, there are usually some um, uh, software solutions that are provided by software providers that you can actually use to test and they can be able to give you metrics on how performance is your how how fast is your application doing a certain a certain process? How fast is it doing a a, a particular uh, uh, process? I think I I on the software side I'll get back I'll I'll go and see like examples of the uh, applications that you can use. But on the hardware side I know that there are usually metrics that you can be able to attach or monitors that you can be able to attach to your hardware and they can give you the results of how fast. Uh, your certain application or how fast a certain process took to be processed in your in your server or in your um, uh, in your load balancer or something or anything like that even from the cloud like even uh, on our side like for example I can use the example of Microsoft it can we have some monitoring tools that we can install you can maybe say we install it in your server and then it gives you the results of how fast a particular request took or how fast a certain process took so they are they are there that you can use but on the software on the software level for a developer i know you can actual you can actually write the tests like a unit test to check is this class um, uh, using another class that that is supposed to use in a scalable way yeah 
I think once we go to the part where we are going to maybe write the code, maybe that can be a little bit clearer. Uh, I, I hope so. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other question? Okay. So if there are no more questions, I think let us now <clears throat> go to the to the side of it. So for those who are joining us, I, I just said we are going to first of all at least look at the basic principles of object object oriented programming because these principles uh are what solid principles mostly rely on. So it is good for us to have a grasp of, first of all, these four basic principles of object-oriented programming so that we can be able to understand the solid principles. So uh, for those of us uh, that you know, object-oriented programming, as you know, is a programming language that is uh, a program paradigm that is just uh, uh, based upon the idea of having classes, which are like the classes, the house objects, and then objects, they, they are the ones that now determine um, what are these classes all about, what a class is capable of. So we just, uh, we, we can just say a class is just a blueprint for, uh, for the objects that you are going to use. So generally, object oriented is just an, a paradigm where we are, all our programming efforts and everything are just centered around objects so we create objects that do different uh different tasks so our projects are our gateways to entering a particular class and accessing the methods that are in that class and doing everything that that class is capable of doing so so the four basic principles of object oriented programming that you know we have encapsulation we have data abstraction polymorphism and inheritance so when you hear about uh, four pillars of object object oriented programming, we are talking about these four principles. So let us try and look at high level what each and every principle uh, is all about. So encapsulation is just an idea or just a way of making sure that maybe the data that we consider sensitive is hidden from the users or we're just not allowing our users to access and maybe edit any data that they feel like from our class. So there is data that you consider, no, this one should not be accessed or this one should not be seen or this one can be seen and should not be edited. So encapsulation allows us to have that freedom that we decide this is what you can be able to do with this data. And with that, um, for you to be able to achieve encapsulation, you have to do two things. You have to declare a class uh, variables or attributes that's private. So as we know, these are access modifiers. So if you if you declare something private, let's say a variable and, or an attribute, it means that it can only be accessed from within that class. So uh, a class that is, or something that is outside that class will not be able to access that particular variable. So you might ask yourself now, if I, if I declare a certain variable private and it can only be accessed from that class, so what will that be of use if maybe another class from outside wants to be able to access that particular variable or use it? So for you to be able to allow others to use it, that is now when you go ahead and you provide the getters and setter methods and remember the getters and setters methods have to be public so that it is through the get and set methods that you can be able to access now these private variables and do anything with them so the remember the access modifier for the getters and setters have to be public so so it is through this that we are able to access and update the values of our private variable so as we know when you look at a lot of the methods that we have the get and set um we, a private variable, as we've said, can only be accessed within the same class and outside class cannot be able to have access to it. So, however, it is possible for you to access it if you provide a public get and set methods. So the get methods returns the variable value. So let's say you just want to see this private variable, what value does it have at the moment? So the get method will be able to help you do that because it will return that value. Uh, so the syntax for both the get and the set, they always start with get and set that is in java and then you follow by the name of the variable so and the first letter is in uppercase of course that is java syntax uh, when it comes to that so an example let's say you have a, a public class you've said person and then it has a private string called name 
So as you know, this one private cannot be accessed by any class that is outside person. But for us to be able to provide that functionality, we create a getter and we call it public string. You see, this getter, it's a uh, it's called get name, the getter method, and you see it returns a string because the variable, the, the data type for our name is string. So since we are creating a getter for name, our getter should return string because our, our name is of the data type string. So, and then we say return name. And then in case we want to allow people to have the ability to set or edit this, uh, to edit the value of name, we go ahead and create a setter method. So we have our public void because this is not returning anything. All it is doing is setting this name to a particular val value. So that is why our setter method is void. And then we call it set name. And then we pass it a string. Let's say our, our variable is called new name and it's of the data type string. And then now we come and say, we want you to set this name to be the new name. So in the event that I want to set this name to let's say my name, I will provide my name here in this, uh, I'll say set name, provide my name. So it will mean now this string name will be set to my name. So that is the way in which our private, uh, whatever we have, our private uh, variable can now be set or accessed through getters and, and setters. So, um, as you were trying to explain whatever we've done ahead, um, the get method returns the value of the variable name, as you've seen. The set method takes a parameter that we provided new name and we assigned it to the name variable. So the keyword is used to refer to the current uh, object. So when you are saying uh, this dot name, it means this particular object. Let's say if I've set my name to, uh, to Faustin right now, and then someone else comes and set their name again. So it will mean at that particular instance of that object, that name will refer to whatever name we are referring to. So if it is Faustin, if it is, let's say Peter, if whatever name we are referring to at that moment. So, um, so however, as the, as the name variable is declared private, you cannot access it from outside this class. So how do we access it? Look, let's say in the event that we try and access that variable directly, so we have our main class here, and then we have our public static. This is our main method, like for guys who are in Java, this is where um, processing always starts from. So from our main method, we create an object of the type person. So remember here, our class was called person. So we create an object of the type class person, and then we just say a new person. This is a way of declaring an object. So if you go ahead and say object.name, and we set it to John, it will give us an error because name, remember, is a private. It's a private uh, variable that it's declared as private. So here we have restricted access, like someone cannot just come in and go ahead and just set uh, the, the name, uh, the name to John or whichever what uh, whichever value they want. So what we want them to go ahead and do. Uh, so you see, if you try, like in Java, if you tried to run that, it will give you this. It will tell you name has a private access in person. So, but you're trying to access it like it is not a private variable. So it will try, it will give you the error. So instead it, of us just doing that, now that is where the getters and setters come in. So we use the get and set method. So what we do, yes, we declare an object of type person, our class was person, so we declare an object of that type, but then we come and say, the object that we've declared, let's say my object dot set name. So we are telling it to set the name to John. So, and then we say dot get name, you're telling now, can you return to us what name we have set? So this one dot get name will return the name John. So that will give you John. So that is now the good thing about encapsulation. So we have restricted, not, you cannot just come and set the values uh, the way you want. You either use a set and get method. So how important is that? It gives us better control of the class attributes and methods. So if you decide I want my class to be read only or my attributes to be read only, it means you will just declare a get method to that class. You will not declare a set method. So you see, it has given you the freedom of uh, you specifying what can be done to your attributes. 
let's say you decide, oh, I want my attributes to be write only. So you're going to only provide the setters. You're not going to provide the getters. So you'll provide the setters. Someone can just write and, and, and say this is what your variables will have, but cannot go ahead and read and see what, what is in there. So it gives you the flexibility of deciding what you want your class to, to have. So encapsulation, that is what it gives. It gives you better control of your class attributes and then it's flexible. So you, you as the programmer, you can go ahead and change. You can just change one part of your class without affecting other parts. So if tomorrow you decide, oh, I want my class to be read only, all you have to do is just go to your original, let's say that person class and remove the, the set method and, and your class is now read only. Or if you decide, oh, I want it to be uh, write only, you can go just go there and remove the getter method and then your class will just be write only. So you don't have to actually go to a lot of other parts and do uh, and do a lot of changes. And then we have increased security, of course. So uh, not not anyone or not other classes cannot just come in and edit things in your original class without your consent or they cannot just bypass whatever you've put together because they are restricted. So as you can see, en encapsulation by just us declaring our variables private, we have increased the security of this particular class. Yeah, so that is on enca encapsulation. Anyone who has a question on that? Any question on encapsulation before we go, to, we go to the next principle? Okay, so let's look at inheritance. So in inheritance, as we all know, I think a lot of us are, are, are conversant with what inheritance is all about. So we have the ability of having a super class and a subclass. So what happens is that we can inherit from another class. And the good thing about inheritance is if I am a subclass, it means if I inherit from a superclass, it means I am I'm able to use all the methods, all the attributes that a superclass has, and then I can also add my own on whatever has already been provided by the superclass. So this improves code reuse. It means that I do not have to redo uh, some things over and over again. If a class has a certain functionality that has already been established in it, and I need that functionality, I actually don't have to duplicate the effort on my class. All I have to do is the class that has what I'm interested in, I just inherit from that class. So that is what inheritance is all about and what it helps us with. So it is possible to inherit attributes and methods from one class to another. So we have two categories, as you know, a subclass, this is the child, so the child that inherits from another class and then the superclass is the parent. So the class that is being inherited from. And remember, in Java, we use the keyword extend. So every time you see uh, the name of the class and then extend that follows it, you just know that this is a subclass and it is inheriting from another superclass. So we look at the, at an example. We have a car subclass that inherits the attributes of the vehicle superclass. So for example, we have a class here, a class vehicle, and it has a protected. So uh, let me uh, give some context on the protected uh, the protected keyword. Uh, this is an access modifier. And what it means is that uh, this particular um, variable can be accessed by either the classes that are in the same package as the vehicle class or a class that inherits from the vehicle class. So when you see protected mostly in your code, you just know that this class probably it is being inherited from that the class is prob probably a parent class. So this is protected is usually a way of just um, someone knowing uh, this probably is a parent class. There's some class somewhere that is inheriting from this particular class. So as you can see, our parent class just has one method that uh, it's a void method that is honk. Let's say it's returning uh, the voice uh, the 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 particular uh, sound that a car makes when we honk, for example. And then we have our, our child class or our subclass. So you see, as you can see, a class car extends vehicle. So as you, every time you see this extends keyword in Java, whoever is on the left is the subclass and whatever is on the right is the parent class. So our car is inheriting from the vehicle class. So here, our car now can be able to go ahead and 
um, create its own uh, variables or whatever it wants. So we have our private string. Let's say we are declaring a string called uh, model name. It's a Mustang. So the vehicle brand was Ford. It's our, our, our model name is Mustang. So when you go ahead and and uh, we in our main methods, let's say we create a car object. So we say uh, car, my car. So we are creating an object of this car class that we are in. And then we say it's a new car. So after we create this object, it means now we can be able to access, as we said, an object is a doorway to us accessing the methods and anything that is in our class. So you can see my car dot honk. Even though this object is the object of our subclass, it can be able to access methods that are in our super class. And that is because we have inherited from our superclass. So every method or anything that is available in that was there in our superclass is now available in our subclass. So as you can see, we have gone ahead. We have we, we can be able to access the the honk method. And then when you go ahead and we output, let's say my car dot brand, it can also go ahead and access this brand. So through this, it means we have access to the attributes. We can be able to access uh, the methods or anything that is in our in our super class. So you see, so this one has helped us. We did not have to go ahead and declare a variable called brand and another um, another method called honk in our car class. All we needed to do is just inherit it, inherit from the vehicle class. And as you can see, can you imagine the benefit of that? We can inherit from as many. Uh, we can have as many subclasses as we want. If if I come tomorrow and want to still create another subclass that extends the vehicle class, we can always uh, we can always create another subclass, and it will still have all the qualities that are in our superclass. So that is the good thing about uh, inheritance. So there's this uh, you noticed noticed about the protected modifier. We've talked about it. So. Uh, you, we, we've set the brand attribute, attribute in the vehicle to be protected, so it is set to private in the car class will not be able uh, to access it. So uh, if, for example, we by any chance, if we set this to private, remember we talked about setting um, our variables to private, it will mean that you will not be able to access it. So yeah, so protected is also another way of us being able to access uh, variables from our super class. So why and when to use inheritance. So inheritance is just useful for code reusability. So you, we reuse attributes and methods from existing classes. So every time you want to reuse a particular code, you see you've written a, a certain class and you know oh, um, this, this code can be reused in so many places and all that just so oh, I can always rely on inheritance and I can get all these attributes and methods in my new class. Yeah, so that is now what inheritance really helps us with. Um, any question on inheritance? Okay. Um, so we can move to our third. Oh, okay. So we, we can ask, ask ourselves the question. So what if I don't want my class to be inherited from? Because you as a developer, you should have the freedom of deciding, let's say I want this class not to be inherited from, or I want this class to have the capability of being inherited from. So that is now where the final keyword comes into play. So every time you just have a final keyword uh, before your class, it, it means that you do not want anyone to inherit from that class. So every time, is, if let's say if you've declared our vehicle class as final and we try to extend from it, we are definitely going to get a, an error. So the final keyword is a way in Java that helps you to be able to, to say this is uh, the constant or we can say uh, like constant the way we have. We don't want this value to ever change or we don't want this thing to, uh, to change the way it is. So if, for example, there might be that need that whatever you're doing in your class, you don't want to be inherited by any other class or to be pro propagated to any other classes. So you just declare your class final. So it will mean that no any other class can inherit from it. Yeah. So yeah, that one we are trying to inherit from a final class. So you'll definitely get an error yeah, because it will tell you it is a final class. You cannot inherit from it. So that is the importance of inheritance. So you can always, so always know you can always re reuse code. You actually don't have to write the same functionality in in your classes over and over again. Yeah. Okay. Then we go to the concept of polymorphism. So polymorphism just means, let's say, yeah, many forms. Uh, it occurs mostly when we have many classes. Yeah. She has a question to ask. Okay. Okay. Sorry. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Please, I want to ask, can a subclass inherit from more than one superclass? No. Thank you. No, with, yeah, with it, you cannot inherit from more than one class, but that is also, that is provided in, in interfaces, and we are going to look at them. Okay, any other question? Okay, so we can go on. Um, so let's talk about polymorphism. So let's think about this way. In the event that we've said uh, we have a class, we, can, we have the capability of a lot of classes inheriting from our class. And then these classes that have inherited from our class, they also inherit the methods that, that, that our original class had, our superclass had. So the subclasses also have inherited the methods. But we are not going to restrict what our subclasses are going to do with the methods. Uh, one subclass can decide I, I'm going to make this method do this. Another class can decide I'm going to make this method do this. So as you can see, we have that one method, but it is doing different things in the different subclasses. So that is not what polymorphism is all about. It is one entity, but it has so many forms. So uh, let's see that in an example. Like in the previous chapter, we said that we can be able to inherit attributes and methods from other classes. So let's say you use those methods to perform different tasks. So yes, you have inherited this method. You're not restricted on what you're supposed to do. So we are not telling you this is the only thing that you can be able to do with this method. You have the freedom to make that method perform different tasks. So, so this is how now what this is a, a way to perform a single action in different ways. So, for example, let's say we have a superclass animal that has a method called animal sound. And then we have subclasses of animals. Let's say we have pigs, we have cats, we have dogs and birds. And we know all these different animals, they have different animal sounds and they have inherited from the class animal sound. So they also, they will go ahead and have their own implementation of the animal sound. So a pig can decide big oinks and then a car meows and all that. So these are all different implementations of the same method animal sound. So let's, so this is just an example to show that we have our class animal and then it has a, a method called animal sound. And then we have our class pig, which extends animal. And as you can see, pig, you also have the freedom to override and do what you want to with your class, with that method that you have inherited. So as you can see in this case, animal sound, we say the animal makes a sound. You can go ahead and still use, the, you, you can go ahead and implement animal sound and make it do what you want it to do, let's say in the pig class and also in the dog class. So your, that is also the other freedom that you have. It's not because that this one has been implemented here, you cannot be able to do anything with it when, it when you inherit it. So by us doing that, it means our animal sound method has different implementations in the different subclasses. Like in pig, we say pig says we we. And then when it comes to dog, we say dog says bow wow. So these are different implementations of that one method. So uh, now we can create the pig and dog objects and all the animal sound methods on them. And now we have the freedom to actually do that. So let's say when you come to your main class, you can decide you're going to create an object of type animal. So you have created the object and then you create a, an object called my pig of type animal and then also an object called my dog of still type animal. But remember our pig and animal, uh, our pig and dog, they extend uh, they are the extent from animal, so we can be able to access this method that is on the original on the, on our superclass, and also this method that is on our subclasses. So with that, as you can see, it gives us the freedom of making our method uh, behave in whatever way we want it to in the class that it has fallen inside. So that is also another freedom when it comes to polymorphism. So it is also good for code re reusability. So we actually don't have to come with different methods. Uh, we don't have to create different methods because uh, uh, let's say because we are in a different subclass, all we need to do, we can reuse the method that was in our superclass and it will st still do different things in our class without having to rewrite things all over again. So that is also another good thing. So as you know, inheritance and polymorphism always go hand in uh, hand in hand. So how once you get how inheritance works, it becomes also way easier for you to get how polymorphism works. 
Okay, so any question on, on that? Any question on polymorphism? Okay. Um, okay, so let's move to the final uh, uh, the final principle that is data abstraction. Um, so let's say in the event that maybe you have a system that is you you don't want to expose everything to your user, you don't want to expose, let's say, everything to your applications or whatever is accessing your system. So you have the freedom of data abstraction. So data abstraction gives you the, the freedom of you sit down and decide, uh, I don't mind the public or other applications seeing this information or using these methods. So the methods that you'd want the public or other applications to access are the ones that you provide. Those ones that you don't want them to be touched or anything, you don't provide them. So anyone who wants to use your class, they can use the methods that you've provided, but they cannot be able to touch what you have not provided. So that is just what abst abstraction is, like you're, you're actually literally abstracting things. So you hide certain details and you show only the essential information to the user. So you think oh, this is what the user needs to, to finish their process. So you only provide that to the users. So there are two ways in which you can be able to achieve abstraction. So you can either use abstract classes or you can use interfaces. So with abstract classes, uh, like what you just know, for you to be able to know this is an abstract class, you just see it has an abstract keyword. So that means it has, it is an abstract class. So the abstract keyword is an access modifier, like it, it is not specifying how you are supposed to access a particular class or a, or a particular um, variable or, or method. So it's just an unaccessed uh, modifier, but it is used for classes and methods. So an abstract class, it is a class that is restricted uh, and you cannot be able, you cannot use an abstract class to create methods. Uh, sorry, to create objects, like the way we have created objects uh, from our past examples. If a class is abstract, it means that you cannot be able to create methods with that class. And then abstract classes have methods in them. And these methods that they have in them, they're called abstract methods. So an abstract method can only be used in an abstract class. And an abstract method doesn't have a body in it. So remember, we've said we, 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 are, we, want, we, we are providing you with things that you can be able to do. Like if you inherit me, then you have the freedom to go ahead and, and create this and do these actions when it comes to after you have inherited me. So that is what abstract methods do. An abstract method will not have the body. So it is the work of the subclass to provide the functionality of the method body. So all it does, it provides these particular uh, methods and then it is up to you, the subclass to decide if I inherit this, I want this method to do this. Another subclass can inherit and decide I want this method to do this. So that is the, 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 the issue with the abstract classes. So that is that. And then an abstract class can have, when, you, when you, we are dealing with abstract classes, you can have both uh, abstract and regular methods. So an abstract class is not just restricted to it having abstract methods only, it can also have uh, regular methods. Like for, a, for example, you can have an abstract class animal, and then it has an, a, a public abstract void animal sound. So this is an abstract method that is in this abstract class, but it also has a regular method that is called sleep. So it means that, um, First of all, we cannot create an object of this class. The only way for us to be able to use anything that is in this class is if we decide to go ahead and inherit from it. So from the example above, it is not possible to create an object of the animal class. So if you go ahead and do animal and then my object is equal to new animal to create the object of that class, it will fail because we are not allowed to create objects of abstract classes. So to access the abstract class, it must be inherited from, from another class. As you can see, now we have restricted you. you. You cannot just go ahead and create methods like the way you want. So you have restricted people on what they can be able to do. So we are just telling you, all you can be able to do is you inherit the abstract class. So when you inherit the abstract class, it will mean you have to provide the body of the abstract method. So you do not just inherit it and then maybe go ahead and just use 
or whatever methods are there. So you have to provide implementation of this method. So that is one rule that you have to follow. So when you have um, this class being extends our animal class, so public void animal sound, you see our abstract method, the class pig is now providing the body for that particular method. So in our case, we just provided what the pig sound is. And then you see, when you now come to our main class, we can now be able to create an object of class pig because now this one, it's, it's, a, it's a regular class, so there's no issue of us creating an object of it. And then through the object of class pig, we can now access this animal sound that, that was uh, that was first of all declared in the abstract class. So we can be able to access the animal sound and we can also be able to access the sleep method. Because as you know, once we extend from this animal class, regardless of it being an animal, uh, uh, an abstract class, sorry, we, the rules of inheritance still apply. We, we get all the attributes and all the methods that in that class. So yeah, so that is one thing. So that is one thing you should know that when you create your abstract class, whatever abstract methods that you have declared in your abstract class, and any class that is inheriting from you will have to provide an implementation of that method. So that means when you're creating that class, be sure that you put methods that are only necessary in each. You just don't go ahead and just add methods, methods and methods to that class. And maybe the classes that would be inheriting from it will not need majority of those methods. So you should be sure that that class, uh, the abstract class only has methods that are uh, that are needed. And then if a class extends it, it will provide the, the body for, for, for that particular method. Yeah. So the main issue about abstraction is just to, to achieve security. So this because this means that you hide certain details and you only show the important details uh, of an object. So you only show what you want your users to see and access. So that is one way of uh, uh, achieving that abstraction you see through abstract classes. The other way that you can be able to achieve that is through interfaces. So, um, so interfaces, this is now a completely abstract class. What does that mean? That with interfaces, you only provide, uh, you only declare the methods and only these uh, exist. Like you remember in abstract classes, it can have both abstract methods and normal, the, the other kind of methods. Like, but in an interface, you cannot be able to add the other kinds of methods. You only provide uh, you only provide declarations of methods. And then whoever will implement the interface, they are the ones now who, is, who are going to provide the body for these methods. So there's no way in which you can create an interface and then we find a method that has a body in that interface. That one is wrong. So that is why we say it's a, it's a completely abstract class. And then another thing that you should know about interfaces is that you just you use it to group related methods with empty bodies. So just you, you don't just place any methods in a particular interface. Like you try as much as possible. You look at your methods and then the ones that do uh, tasks that are related, you group them into one interface. So that means you can have as many interfaces as you want just make them to be, uh, let's say, functional, functionally understandable or let them seem to be working together. You just don't add any methods in, in, in a particular interface. So to access an interface uh, methods, the interface must be implemented uh, like the way you inherit, but only with interfaces instead of extend, you use implement keyword. Uh, and then you you provide it, you provide uh, the name of the interface. So like the way we are saying extends in, in um, inheritance, we use implement when you're implementing an interface. And remember with an interface, the other ones we are using, let's say abstract class or the name of the class with interface, you use the, the name interface. So like here, we've declared an interface animal and then you provide uh, public methods in it, animal sound and, 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 and another method called sleep, as you can see, our methods are just skeleton of the methods that we have provide no bodies in it. And then whichever class will implement our interface, they have to provide the body of the method. Another thing to note, when you implement the interface, it means that you have to provide uh, an implementation of all these methods that are in an interface. So can you imagine if maybe your interface has, uh, let's say 20 methods in it, 
and someone implements that interface, it will mean they'll have to provide bodies for all the 20 methods. So that is why it is important for you to make sure that your interface only has the methods that a class would need or related methods, because it will mean even when someone is going to implement your interface, they have to provide the implementation of all the methods in those in that interface. So you should avoid uh, big interfaces or interfaces that, are, that do too much because it will mean they'll have a lot of load uh, with that person who's trying to implement them. Yeah, so that is one thing that you should note about interfaces. And then when it comes here, it works more or less the same. So when you, we, we, we create an object of the class pig and then new pig, so by pig.animal sound, and then we can be able now to access the methods that are in our in our class because we have provided implementations for those methods in our class. Yeah. So interfaces, remember, they are completely abstract class. They are, they are, it's like a complete abstract class. We cannot find a, a normal method in an interface. So some notes to note on interfaces. Uh, like abstract classes, interfaces cannot be used to create objects. So you, you cannot be, you cannot, we cannot find in your code that you've created an uh, an object from a particular interface. Even your your ID or whichever will give you an error. And then interface methods do not have a body. So the body is always provided by the class that is that implements the interface. So on the implementation of an interface, you must override all of its methods. So by overriding, that is that that what you mean is that you have to provide an implementation of all the methods. So you cannot skip and say, I, I, I'm not using this method, so I will not provide implementation for them. So that is where you can find in some code, you'll find that someone has just uh, written a method and then they've just written a void method and then a method that does nothing. And then you wonder why sometimes you might find that they they implemented a certain interface, but in their class they don't need to they don't need to use that method, but that method is in the interface that they implemented. So you find that they just write a dummy, just a void method in their code, and you wonder what is this method doing? Yeah. So and so those are some of the practices that you should avoid, and we we'll look at them now in the solid principles that the a way of. Uh, avoiding how to have these methods that do, do nothing in interfaces and forcing people to uh, have a lot of methods in their code that they are really not using. And then, sorry, um, and then interface methods by default are abstract and public. So you actually don't need to write abstract method, uh, abs public abstract method when, when you're writing your, your, your interface, because by default, provided you've declared something to be an interface, by default, it will just be abstract and public. And then, and then the attributes, that is on the method, the attributes that you declare on interfaces, because interfaces can have attributes, um, they are by default public, static, and final. So if, for example, you declare a certain attribute or a variable and give it a value in an interface, it cannot be changed. Because as you know, when you have the final keyword, it means that nothing, you cannot change that particular value. And then an interface cannot have a constructor because as you know, constructors are the ones that help us to create objects. And since you've said we cannot be able to create objects from interfaces, so we cannot have constructors in, 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 in our interfaces. Okay, so um, when and where to use interfaces. So as you've seen to achieve security because interfaces are still for data abstraction. So they help us to achieve security. So uh, you hide certain details and you only show the details that you want to show. Um, as you know, as we were, we had, we had, I had answered that previous question, we don't support multiple inheritance. So you can only inherit from one superclass, but you can implement multiple interfaces. So if you, if you think that hey, maybe uh, I'll have diff, uh, one class uh, inheriting uh, or needing Different inter uh, different things that you have instead of declaring them as classes, you can declare them as interfaces because with interfaces, the a class can be able to implement multiple interfaces. So, uh, to implement multiple interfaces, you just separate them with a comma. Let's say let's say an uh, let's say an example of how to implement uh, multiple interfaces. Um, so we have an interface, let's say first interface, you declared your method there, and then second interface, you have declared your method there. So we have a class demo class. So uh, our demo class, you just say implements, you just write your interface separated by a comma and then your other interface. So here you can write as many interfaces as you want. And then remember, when you come when you come down to your class, you have to override all the methods that are your, inter your interfaces. So it means 
you have to provide an implementation for my method and then you also have to provide an implementation for my, my other method. So that is why you see here we have provided implementations for that method and then we have also provided an implementation for the other method. So this one is an example of a class that has implemented multiple interfaces. And then when you come to the main class, we just use a class as normal. We just created an object of the demo class. And then with our object, it means we can be able to access any methods that are in our, uh, our class. Consequently, they're also in our interface. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that wraps up on our interface and our object-oriented programming principles. So any questions on them, on, on interfaces or data abstraction, Any questions? Okay. Yes, yeah, so if there are no more questions, I think now we can go to our agenda of, the, of, of our class. Now we want to see um, what are our solid principles and then how can we go ahead and apply our solid principles. And then we also look at uh, how how I put this lesson is now how we can be able to yeah. Hello. So it's just about the difference between protected and private. I don't know if you have you addressed that. Yeah. The comments in the chat. Okay. Um, the difference between protected and and private. I think we saw a protected, but I'll just generally uh, tell you, protected is. When, when you use a protected access modifier, it will mean like, for example, here we've used protected, it will mean that this particular uh, attribute can be accessed in package, in the, same, in the same package as the class. As you know, like in most of us, in our programming languages that we have, we have packages. By packages, we mean it's a way in which you've grouped our classes together. So these protected attributes, like this, this brand can be seen by classes that are in the same package as vehicle. So that is what protected means. And also classes that have inherited our class vehicle. You know, you can inherit from a class that is not in the same package as yours. So if our attribute has protected, it will mean that even if a class that is outside our package inherits it, inherits our vehicle class, it can be able to see this attribute. That is unprotected. So protected mainly, generally, you can say the scope of that attribute is all the classes that are in the same package as your class and the subclasses of your class. They can be able to access it. But when it comes to private, only that class that you are in can access it. Nothing else can access. So that is when we were when we were looking at um, at uh, encapsulation. So when you declare a particular attribute as private. So like this string name, it means it can only be accessed or seen by class person only. So whether you're in the same package or anything, provided you are outside this class person or you're outside that class, you cannot be able to access that attribute. So that is the difference between protected and private. Any other question? And mostly, as I pointed out, like mostly when you see a protected attribute, you just know that maybe there is inheritance somewhere. So that is like a, a, a cue that oh, this class is a super class. So there's some, some class somewhere that is inheriting from it. This one is asking in the real world, how can we use abstraction? In the, in the real world? Um, so let me think. Um, Okay, so let's see which application can I use that can clearly point out abstraction. Okay, so let's say you have a user um, and maybe I'm setting up my profile. Um, let's say I'm setting up my profile and then um, I've, I've set up my profile, I've, I've 
let's say it's a social network, I've put my photos, I've put uh, everything that I want in that particular social uh, network, but this is information about me. So I have, um, I have my photo up, I have my bio and everything. And then let's say it's a DB that is collecting information about me. So that DB also collects information about my username and my password and all that. And then let's say another application wants to consume uh, data, like data about me. So we want to provide data to this other application that wants to consume data about me, but there's some data we don't want to provide to this application. So let's say, obviously, I don't want this application to consume my username or to consume my password or to even have uh, to see my username or my password. But maybe I wanted to see my bio or uh, let's say maybe I wanted to also see my profile picture if, want, if it wants to access that. So how do I restrict this? So we can decide and see, let's say, let's, we say let's provide an interface. And then this interface, make it public to these other applications that wants to consume user information. But for this, for this interface that you're providing, let it only have methods for this other application to only access the user profile and the uh, bio information. And then we don't provide anything else. So the only way that application can be able to access any information about this user is about is through these methods that only you can only touch on the bio and the profile picture. But remember, but on the back end, we have so much more, so much other information about this particular user. But we have protected things like the username. We have not, we, we cannot, we have not. Uh, allowed this person to use them we are, or this application to access it. We have protected things like passwords and all that. So it, it it's we can say in real world applications, when you think of situations in which you have a lot of information about something, especially when it comes to user information, but you just want some part of that information to be consumed and others not to, then you can you can maybe think about abstraction. I don't know if that is clear. Thank you, ma'am. I think that should be clear. You could go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So we can go ahead to the solid principles. Um, yeah. So when it comes to the object oriented uh, hierarchy, uh, this concept that we have talked about, uh, we, we, we might seem, they might seem like very simple concepts that you can be able to apply it. Uh, we can be able to use and apply. Um, so the basic idea that is generally behind object-oriented programming is simple because we are just talking about classes and then we are talking about these objects that we can be able to create and through objects you can be able to access every uh, the resources that are in a particular class. So yes, we can think of it as being an easy thing, but it because we think that it is easy, uh, we often tend to make mistakes. So you can see you can find that someone has inherited. Uh, from too many classes, and then we can, uh, because we have the freedom of writing methods, you can find that a class has a lot of methods, so a class is doing so much. Uh, you can find that you can find classes are doing a lot of a, a lot of functions, like you can find someone has written a class that does a million functionalities and all that. So um, eventually, it can lead to a code code that is not working or it is working, but it's not even coherent. You cannot understand what is going on. And then, or it is not even easily readable, or you cannot upgrade that code or, or things like that. So that is now where solid principles come in. So solid principles are just things that we can, we can just say these are like things that we can put at the back of our head so that every time or any time you're doing our development, we can be able to think, um, am I violating this? So if I'm violating this particular principle, it means that my code is will not be easily scalable or is not maintainable or anything like that. So it just, they're just, you can say just uh, guidelines that can be able to help us in achieving, in achieving more, yeah. So uh, because of that reason of having issues to do with code maintainability, readability, and coming up with just buggy code. Uh, computer scientists, engineers, and theoretical programmers, they dedicated their time to develop some rules and principles that we can lead to good code. So th that is what solid principles are. They're just rules that you can be able to follow for us to be able to come up with good code. So there are so many books that I explain these basic principles of object-oriented programming. Yeah, so there's these are theory of objects and then object 
oriented software construction. So there are things that you can be able to sit down and maybe read if you want to find out more about object oriented programming. So uh, here we are going to discuss a set of five uh, principles that are called the solid uh, solid principle. So it's just a mnemonic or an ac acronym uh, it was, that was introduced by Michael Feathers uh, for the first five principles named by uh, Robert Martin. So Robert Martin is the one who came with the, with the principles, but the acronym was developed by Michael Feathers. So they are the, these principles. We have the single responsibility principle. We have the open closed principle. We have the list of substitution principle, and then we have the interface segregation principle, and then the dependency inversion principle. So uh, before we even start on them, so with the object oriented principles that you have looked at, now we are going to see how now do we apply? Yes, we've talked about inheritance. So how do, do I apply inheritance so that I can ensure that I have um, good code? that I have maintainable code. How do I apply encapsulation or things like that? So that is what you are going to look at. And then the way I've structured this is that like when you are looking at a particular principle, we are going to look at a bad example of it, like someone who has written code that is violating that principle. And then how can we go ahead and improve on it? So we'll have a, both a bad and a good example. How, how you have violated the principle if you write your code this way and then how you can be able to change and 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 improve on that particular principle so with that uh so when do we uh the solid uh principles should be applied when you're writing object ori oriented code so why do we do that so that you can ensure coupling is low uh because as you know if your code is tightly coupled it means that the things that are not supposed to depend on each other, they're actually depending on each other. Like you find that classes are highly depending on each other instead of you just using maybe an, a, a, an abstraction there so that they depend on, on the abstraction that other than depending on, the, on each other. So when you're following this principle, you are going to ensure that coupling is low so that our code is not highly coupled. And then cohesion is high that uh, they can be able to flow and interact with each other smoothly. And then our code is also testable. Let's say you can be able to pinpoint a component and test it without having to include a lot of other components that you actually don't need maybe in your test. And then we can extend our code so it is highly extensible. Uh, and then the ability of, of it to be agile is maximized. So our code is flexible, so it means we can be able to do a lot with it. So your code base must always be readable, even to a newcomer to the project regardless of his or her professional level. And I have to I have to admit that like this is something that is actually really hard in also in even these big corporations, you find that you go, um, you're done an introduction and then you're just given a code base and you really can't even understand what is going on. Like even maybe the flow is not there, even the naming or sometimes and all that. So at least this will help us to even write readable code base. And then Adding or removing a component should be easy and the code should be testable. So it should not be in such a way that if we remove a certain component, that our whole code or our whole logic fails or it falls. So we should be able to have code that we have the flexibility of removing a component and maybe things work uh, fine or minimally fine. And then we can also add things and they should not break our, our original logic or our code base. So. So the the solid approach, the main goal is to minimize any dependencies between classes. That is the main thing. Like classes should not depend on each other. They should at, le at least depend on an abstraction so that we can, let's say they depend on an interface. So we can change that interface anytime other than going ahead and changing classes themselves. So and then to fully realize the benefits of the solid principle, the application must be large. Yeah, so that is why you find that uh, the advantages are not that visible on a small application. But as we know, even the large application starts from a small application. So in our minimal programming or which, whichever place we start, we should start with our solid principles in mind so that even if it grows and big, becomes a big application, it was built on a foundation of having it uh, being under solid principles. So, but even the largest applications always begin with small one, yeah. So we must always adhere it from the beginning, especially if we don't know the answer as we were asking ourselves initially, what size will the application grow, ultimately grow to? So we might not know that answer when we are beginning. So that is why when you are beginning, we should build with uh, solid principles in mind.
So it becomes almost impossible to employ the solid rules as your application grows. So without completely redesigning. So that is why you're saying if you don't follow the solid rules from the beginning, when you start following it later, it will mean that you'll have to redesign a lot of things and you'll have to rewrite a lot of things. Yeah, so which is not a very good use of our time. So let's start with the single responsibility principle. So what this principle states that each class should be responsible for a single part or functionality of the system. So the moment you notice that your class is doing more than one function, it means you need to break that class into two or into whichever number you need to have. So please ensure that your class uh, is responsible for one functionality or it has just a single responsibility. So that when it has a single responsibility, so you mean it means that there should never be more than one reason for your class to change. Like your class should not be doing this. It should not be, let's say it is changing data. It is also printing and, and, and doing that. There's some functionalities that you can think of and see, oh, this one can belong to another class or something like that. And also you should avoid God classes. So God classes are these classes that do like almost everything. And mostly for those of us who are maybe software uh, uh, engineers or developers and we are working in companies and all that, there's that one project that you all know that maybe has a God class. Like when you just look at that class, it is the class that is doing almost everything in that system. So if that class breaks or you break anything in that class, it means your, your system is dead. So you should avoid God classes as much as you can. And then if you see that you have a big class, you should split that class into smaller ones. So the moment you notice that your class is doing too much, it has uh, so many functions, just split it into the number of classes that, so that you ensure that a class is just responsible for one functionality. So the single responsibility principle um, is founded on one of the basic general ideas of object-oriented programming. So the so-called divide and conquer. So uh, as you know, like, if you want to, a lot of um, computer science concepts and even algorithms and everything are just based on the divide and conquer principles, whereby if you want to solve a um, big problem or you have a, a, a this problem, you just start by solving it multiple sub problems. So you divide it into sub problems and then you, when you solve a, a sub problem, you're moving towards solving the actual big problem. So that is now the approach that you use on the single responsibility principle. So uh, also, we also prevent um, the creation of good objects, like your object does too much, yeah, because eventually it means if you have a God class, you'll eventually end up with a God object. Because if you create an object of that class of yours, it will mean your, objects, uh, your object can do too much. So you should, we should also avoid having such. So the classes you write should be not be like a Swiss knife. So that is what you should put at the uh, back of your mind. It should not be able to do as it's so many things. You should do one thing and do that one thing really well. OK, uh, so that is what you just think. Just think of it as every object should have a single responsibility and all its services should be narrowly aligned to that particular responsibility. Yeah, so single responsibility as the name of the principle outlines. So let's look at a bad example of a single responsibility. So let's consider the, the code that is uh, uh, in our class, uh, in our, on our screens, it's a Java code. So the ideal uh, classic example in a Java where we have objects that can be able to print themselves. So we have a class, it has a string text, an author and a length. And then we have the get the getter method and the setter method. So we, we have the get method for the text and set method, the get method for the author and the set method, and then the get um, method for length and the set method. And then in that same class, we have a method that can be able to change the text. So we say all letters to uppercase. So we have a method that can maybe we, when, you, when, when we pass it some text, it changes the, uh, all the, uh, the letters to uppercase. And then we also have another method that lets maybe finds a subtext and then deletes it. So maybe you pass it a string and then you say find this string from this particular uh, from this particular word and then delete that particular text or something like that. And then it also has another method for formatting output. So as you know, it has a print text method. So this method is used to print our output. So this class does let's say those three different functionalities. So when you look at that code from the first glance, it might look correctly written. Actually, for most of us, it is it looks correctly written. So however, it contradicts the single responsibility principle in that it has multiple reasons to change. So we have two methods. 
which change the text itself. So we have a method that we, we have, as you can see, we have this method, it changes the text to uppercase. We also have another method that we are telling it to, you find the subtext and then you delete it. So there, there are two methods that actually change the text themselves. And then we have another one that we've told it to print. So uh, that, it, that, that we can be able to print. So if any of these methods are called, the class will change. Because if you call the, uh, the, uh, the uppercase, it means something will change. If you call the delete subtext, something will change. If you call the printing one, it will outline, uh, output our output to, the, to us. So, so it is not good. It mixes logic with, with the class the logic of the class with the presentation. So the printing is the presentation part. So we are mixing whatever we are cooking out, let's say, behind our kitchen, and then also what we are, we are presenting to our customers. So a better way of us to be able to do it, we can decide, let the logic stay in one class, and then the presentation stay in another class. So we divide the responsibility. So uh, we can write another class whose only concern is to print. So the responsibility of our class printer will just to print the text. And then the, this other class, we just let it change the text. So we decided to stick with the all letters to uppercase method and the one that finds a subtext and deletes it. So this way, we have separated the functional and the cosmetic parts of our class. So that is also another thing you should think about. Like, let's say if you find in your code, uh, let's say the cosmetic part, like the presentational parts of your code is in the same, um, is in the same uh, uh, class as the functional part of your code, you can think of maybe separating these two concerns. Like let the presentation be in one class and then let the functionality be in another class. Yeah. So, in, so as we've said in the second example, we have divided the responsibility of editing the text and printing the text between two classes. So we can notice that if an error occurred, the debugging would be easier because let's say if the error is is on printing, we'll just know the presentation is on the is on the print text on the printer class. Also, even when we are debugging, it's easier for us to know because the moment let's say we are using a debugger and our debugger hits this class, then in our mind we we'll know okay maybe the error now is on the printing side of things. And then if maybe our debugger comes to this, then we know, oh, the error maybe is on the functional side of things. But you know, but you see, if these two are mixed together, it's hard for us to even know at what point are we hitting an error. So um, it is easier. See, it will be that difficult to, uh, to recognize when the mistake is. Um, so there's also the uh, less risk of accidentally introducing software bugs since you're just modifying smaller portions of code. So let's say if, for example, even this class was, was we were talking about, let's say it wasn't this simple. Maybe it was a, a class that has, or, or it does a lot, and maybe you're doing something and you introduce, uh, maybe you're doing something new and you've added a new concept or a new thing to that God class, and what, whatever you've added breaks. So you can imagine you'll have broken an error, that small error will, or the error that has been introduced will break a whole functionality. But if you're dealing with classes that have been segmented, let's say, and you come and you introduce, let's say, an error on the class uh, text part, it will mean only this class text will be broken. The printer class will still work fine because the error will have just been introduced on the smaller segment of the code. So that is also another, uh, another thing. So, even though it is not that noticeable in this example, since it is a small example, though, so this kind of approach allows you to see the bigger picture and not lose yourself in the code. So it makes programs easier to upgrade and expand. So without the class being too extensive and the code become confusing. So because we have smaller, uh, smaller classes that do a particular function, it's even easier for you to understand this class does this as compared to, can you imagine you having all the functionality bungled up in one class, even the flow and understanding that code becomes hard. So I think with this in mind, you can think of ways in which maybe if you have a code base that do, does this a lot, so think of ways in which you can be able to go and separate things and make each classes have a single responsibility. Yeah. So with that, I think we're done with the single responsibility principle. Any question on it before we go to the next one? Any question on the single responsibility? Okay. Okay. I want to believe that one was at least simple enough. Uh, so our second, our second, uh, uh, our second, sorry, principle is the open-closed principle. 
So as applications evolve, changes are required. As you know, we cannot, we, changes are always inevitable. We cannot say that once you've built this, it can never change. So we will always have changes. So changes are required when we have new functionality, we are adding new functionality or the existing functionality is updated. So these are changes. So often in both situations, let's say we have a new functionality or an existing functionality is updated, you need to modify the existing code. And then that carries the risk of breaking the application's functionality, as you know, and we have all, all, all of us who are software engineers, you've seen that like mostly, most of the time when we, we, we just add something new or we update something, function, uh, the application functionality is bound to break or most likely will break. So for good application design, and the code writing part, you should avoid change in the existing code when requirements change. So instead, you should just extend the existing functionality by adding your new code to meet the new requirements. So you can achieve this by following the open close principle. So what we are doing here is that is if we want to do something, instead of changing our underlying functionality, we just extend. Say we want to add something, we will just extend whatever we have and let it suit our, our new functionality or whatever something new you want to introduce. And that is now what the open close uh, principle uh, we are going to, to, to see. So, uh, uh, Barton Mayer is the one person who coined the open close principle, uh, which first appeared in his book, The Object Oriented Software. Uh, construction. So this was just about eight years before the initial release of Java. So this means that these principles were actually coined before the, these, a lot of these programming languages came into, into place. So this means that this before even these object-oriented programming languages came and became popular, people were thinking about ways of creating readable code. So for, for us to just try and understand, it the principle states that Software entities, we're talking about classes, modules, functions, uh, uh, and et cetera. They should be open for extension, but closed for mod modification. So your software should allow someone to extend it, but it should not allow one to modify it. Like the, the only way for you to be able to uh, attract it is you go ahead and extend it, use extend its functionality, but not change the actual functionality as you're adding something new to, to it. So let's look at the two phases there, open for extension, but closed for modification. So for open for extension, uh, so this means that uh, the behavior of a software module, say a class, it can be extended to make it behave in new and different ways. And as you can see, we have seen um, something like polymorphism, whereby we were able to extend the class and we are able to make it behave in different ways without changing the underlying the underlying code. Like our extension now, we will make our behavior or we will make it behave differently in our extension, but we have not gone ahead and changed our underlying code. So, so as we have said, it's not, uh, it's not limited to inheritance using the Java extent keyword. So um, as mentioned earlier, Java did not exist at that time. So we are not, we are not really just talking about a uh, programming language, like we are going to use the extent keyword or something like that like that so you should what it means that even when you are creating your module when you are creating whatever uh whatever piece of code you are creating you should provide ways in which people can extend or they can alter the behavior of your code without they can alter uh, uh, sorry they they you should provide extension points to alter its behavior so someone should not go to your backbone or your, your functionality and change it from there. No, they should just extend that functionality and change it in their own space or whatever they, are, they, they want to achieve. So uh, so that as we can see that for us, we are now on under object-oriented polymorphism is what we can be able to use to achieve this. And then close for modification, what this means is that the source code of a module of such a module should always remain unchanged. So it might initially appear that the phrases are conflicting. How can we change the behavior of a module without making changes to it? So this is abstraction. So that is now where we, we are talking about abstraction. So you can create abstraction, the interfaces and the, uh, and the classes, these are fixed. Because remember, we said once you have, you have in head, once you've, you've, you've extended, oh, you have uh, implemented uh, an interface, you, you, it is fixed, like you cannot be, be able to go beyond that particular interface. But no one is 
preventing you from doing what you want to do with the particular methods that are in that particular interface. So we have prevented you from maybe going beyond the scope of that interface, but on the behavior, on what you want to do with the methods in that interface, we have not restricted you. You can decide that method can do whatever it wants in your particular application. So maybe let's look at an example and and see uh, maybe how how these two, uh, how the open close principle uh, looks like. So we look at an example whereby the open close principle has been violated. So let's say consider an insurance system that validates health insurance claims before approving one. So uh, we we can follow the complementary, the single responsibility principle to model these requirements by creating two separate classes. So we, we've said we just want our class to do one, one single uh, responsibility. So we have the health insurance surveyor. So this is the person that validates the claim. So this class is responsible for validating the claims and see is this claim valid or not. And then we have the, let's say the claim approval manager. So this is the class that now approves the claim. So after it has been validated, then the, uh, the claim approval class approves this particular claim. So we have gone ahead and created those cl two classes. So our health insurance, so let's say our health insurance surveyor class, it has one uh, public method that returns a bullion. So we are just uh, saying, is it a valid claim? And then maybe return true if it is valid. And then we have our claim approval manager class. So this has a process claim um, method in it that is supplied with a, a, um, it's supplied with a parameter that is of type health insurance surveyor. So we have created a, a parameter that is of the type of the health insurance surveyor class. And then that is what we supply in our method. So we just check is, is the uh, surveyor, this one, the this variable that is referring to our health insurance surveyor. And then we look at the valid, is our claim valid? So if our claim is valid, then it goes ahead and approves the claim. That is our approval manager. So generally what we are doing here is that our claim approval uh, manager class depends on the health insurance surveyor. The results of the is valid here as what is going to determine the action of the claim approval manager. So yes, we have achieved the single responsibility part. And then now let's see if a situation comes up. So both the surveyor and the claim manager classes work fine and the design of the insurance system appears perfect until we introduce a new requirement to, let's say we want to process vehicle insurance claims because this is an insurance company. So it can have health insurance, vehicle insurance, all the possibilities. Now we have another, uh, we have another requirement. We are supposed now to go ahead and process vehicle insurance claims. So we now need to include a new vehicle insurance let's say, surveyor class for us to be able to deal with vehicle insurance. So, and this will not create any problems from the beginning, but we also need to modify our claim approval manager class to process the vehicle insurance claim. So remember, we had the process health claim uh, uh, method. So we are also going to introduce another method that you're going to call process vehicle claim. So these are modified claim approval manager will be. So we have added another new method in our in our process, uh, in, our, in our claim approval manager. So another method that is going to deal with how we are going to process our vehicle claims. So let's continue and see. So in the example above, we have modified the claim approval manager class by adding our new process vehicle claim method so that we can be able to incorporate our new functionality. So as a parent, this is a clear violation of the open closed principle. So because we have actually gone ahead and uh, modified a functionality, we have actually modified a functionality by adding another new method into it. So we need to modify the class to add support for new functionality. So can you imagine if tomorrow someone else comes and we say we have another type of claim, it will mean our claim approval manager class will continue growing and growing because we'll be adding all these new supports over and over again. So we, we violated the open close principle at the very first instance we wrote the claim approval manager class. So this may appear, may appear like it's something small in our current example, but consider the consequences if it is an, it's an enterprise application that we need to keep pace with the fast changing business demands. 
So for each change, you need to modify, test, and deploy the entire application. So can you imagine in the process whereby this is a system maybe we have that is in production, and then these new changes and, fun and, and, and functions, functionality changes and requests come over and over again. So it means we are going, modifying the actual functionality all this time, and then we have to test and do all these things, and maybe we are already in production. So when you look at it from a broader perspective or from an enterprise perspective, this is really not a good practice. So it makes the application fragile because it means it can always break for, with every change that we introduce. And then it is also expensive to, to, to extend because, about, because sometimes it will mean that our, our application may have to be offline for some time as we are adding the new functionality. And then it's also prone to software bugs. As we know, as developers, with every new thing that we add, we might there's a possibility of a bug being introduced. So how do we improve uh, our example so that it can be it can be able to fulfill the open close principle. So the ideal approach for the insurance claim example would have been to design the claim approval manager class in a way that it remains open to support more types of insurance claims as we, we've seen, and then closed for any modifications whenever support for a new type of claim is added. So to achieve this, we introduce a layer of abstraction. So we create an abstract class to represent different claim validations behaviors, okay? So let's uh, name the class insurance surveyor. So this abstract class is we can decide it can be um, as we know we can we can decide that it can be an abstract class or even an interface if you want to. So remember we we said about abstract classes and then we have provided an abstract method for that class. So the method for checking if an, an insurance is uh, if a claim is valid or not we provide that method to uh, our abstract class or an, an interface if someone decides to go that way. So we have moved that to an abstract class. Then let's see what we, we are going to do. Then we will write specific classes for each type of claim validation, okay? So our we have our health insurance surveyor, which we had initially, but now it will be extending our insurance surveyor uh, abstract class. So remember, our insurance surveyor abstract class is the one that had an is valid claim method. But now when it is extended by our health surveyor or our vehicle surveyor, they can be able to do whatever logic they have to check its validity. So let's say the process of checking if a health, uh, if the, a health insurance is valid or a vehicle insurance is valid, the, the processes are different. So with abstraction, it means now we have the freedom of going ahead and implementing this method the way we want, how we check for validity in health insurance and vehicle insurance. Now we have the freedom of doing whatever we have in these two different classes. So all they had to do was extend our insurance surveyor abstract class. And then, so in the example above, we wrote the insurance and the vehicle insurance surveyor classes that extended the abstract insurance class. So both classes, they provide different implementations for the is valid claim method. Now we don't have a problem with the implementation. Then we go ahead and now write our claim approval manager class. Now this class follows the open close principle now. So our, our, our class of the claim approval manager, so our the process claim, instead of it uh, taking the, uh, initially as we were taking the let's say health insurance or the or the vehicle insurance it now takes our abstract class so we say insurance the surveyor our ab abstract class and then we come ahead and we we say if it is uh, we check if it is valid or not so in this example we wrote up the process claim method to accept the insurance surveyor which was our abstract class type instead of specifying a concrete type we are not passing it a health insurance or or a vehicle insurance so in this way, any further addition of insurance surveyor implementation will not affect the claim approval manager class. So our insurance system is now open to support more types of insurance claims and closed for any modifications whenever a new claim is added. So what we do is that let's say if we just add a new claim, let's say you have life insurance, let's say it's our new claim, all we we'll need to do, we'll just write a, another class that deals with life insurance that will just extend the insurance surveyor. So once it extends the insurance surveyor, it will do its own functionality. Then for our manager, it means that through our insurance surveyor, the manager can be able to access any other 
classes that have extended the the, the insurance surveyor without having to do to do any changes on it. So our claims approval manager remains clean, but we can also add any other functionalities that we want to add, provided they will extend our abstraction, which is the insurance surveyor. So that is what she's just saying here. In this way, any further addition of insurance uh, survey implementation, they will not affect the claim approval manager class. So we're not doing any concrete changes in that. Our claim manager will remain the same. So our insurance system is now open to, su uh, to support more types of insurance claims because we can always add them, provided they extend the insurance surveyor, and then closed for any modifications whenever a new claim type is added. So when we add a new claim type, we actually don't have to come and modify anything in this particular class. So we have been able to uh, achieve our uh, our closed our open and closed uh, principle. So let's say if you wanted to test our um, example above, we can write a, a unit test uh, in Java. So using a uh, J unit. So our test we we say it's uh, yes it's a uh, test process claim for example, and then it throws an exception. Let's say if it fails, and then we create um. And, and a, a variable of the type health insurance surveyor, and then, and, uh, sorry, an object of the type health ins insurance surveyor, we, we create another object uh, of the claim manager. And then we come here and say, uh, claim one for the manager dot process claim, process our health insurance. So we want to see, we need to successfully process our health insurance. And then we also create another object for the vehicle insurance. And then, uh, we also create another object for the claim approval manager, and then we just say our claim approval manager, we call the process method in the claim approval manager class, and then we pass it the object of the vehicle insurance surveyor and see, will it be able to successfully process a vehicle insurance? So as you can see from the output, the tests have all, the, we have uh, run one, we have zero failures, zero errors. So it means the tests have passed. That means that it can actually be able to process successfully a health insurance, a vehicle insurance, and even if we added the life insurance and any other additions that we may need, this class will not break. The claim approval manager will not break. It will still process all the insurances without fail, and we have achieved the open closed uh, principle. So in summary, most of the times, so real closures of software, obviously they're not, are not practically possible. Uh, but there's always a chance because there's always a chance that we will always have to change something or modify something. So, for example, in our insurance example, a change in the business rule to process a specific type of claim will require modifying the uh, the claim approval manager class. So, during your enterprise application development, even if you might not always uh, change to write code that satisfy maybe the open closed principle at the very in every aspect, at least taking a step towards it uh, can be beneficial as the application evolves. Yes, we cannot be able to achieve open closed principle fully, but let's say in the event that you can be able to achieve it and provide ways in which someone can extend it instead of changing the code itself, then yeah, we are encouraged to go ahead and follow and, and go there through that path. So I think with that, you're done with the open closed principle. Um, any questions on that before we move to the next principle? Any questions on the open close principle? Okay, let's move to the third principle. So this is the Liskov uh, substitution principle. Um, so it's just the following. So in a computer program, so if S is a subtype of T, then objects of type T may be replaced with objects of type, uh, of type S. That is, objects of type S may substitute objects of type T without altering any of the desirable properties of that program. So whether correctness, task performances, and everything. So if, uh, just plainly put, if, for example, something is a subtype of another, uh, of another uh, class, let's say if S is a subtype of, of T, we can be able to substitute objects in these two without the functionality of the of, of the of the class or the functionality of the program breaking. So, so any object of some class in an object-oriented program can be replaced by an object of a child class. Okay. So if we have the 
the parent class um, relationship. So if we went ahead and implemented the objects of our parent in our in our child, we can be able we can go ahead and replace these objects from our class in our parent without breaking anything. The functionality should remain the same. So in order to understand this principle better, uh, let's remind ourselves about the concept of inheritance and its properties, as well as uh, subtyping, which is a form of uh, polymorphism. So as we have looked at inheritance, so we said this is a concept that is fairly easy to understand. Uh, an object or a class are based on another object or a class. So when a class is inherited from another class, it means that the inherit inherited class is called the subclass that or the child. And then and it contains all the characteristics of the parent class or the superclass, but it can also contain new properties of itself. So uh, we let us illustrate this with a common example. So if you have uh, if you have a class watch, you can inherit from that class and maybe get a class pocket watch. So a pocket watch is still a watch, it's just that it has some additional features with it. So pocket watch has gone and added more more properties to it. So so that it, apart from it being a watch, it is now a pocket watch. So another example that we can we can say we can have a class called woman, and then a child class of woman can be can be called a mother. So a mother is still a woman, but in addition to her being a woman, she she has a child. So the property of her having a child is what has made her be a mother, but she's still a woman. So that is we can see the relationship between parent and child. So a child has all the properties of the parents and they can also have properties of their own. Uh, so, so this brings us to the next term that we're talking about polymorphism as we looked initially. So objects can behave in one way in a certain situation and in another way in some other situation, okay? So in object-oriented programming, this is called context-dependent behavior. So uh, something behaves differently depending on the context in which they are, they are in. So for us to just use the last example that we talked about a mother. Um, so let's say a mother when taking a walk with her child or attending to, to a school parents meeting, they will behave as a mother. But when she's out with her friends at work or simply doing errands, she, might, she will behave as a woman. So uh, depending on the context that this particular object is in, is, is in, the behavior might differ or the behavior might be different. So we have something else that is known as subtyping. So it is a concept that is not identical to polymorphism, but the two have, have been so tightly connected and they have been fused together that in common languages, like when C and Java, and C sharp, uh, the difference between subtyping and, and polymorphism is non-existent. So mostly you find that in Java, when someone is talking about subtyping, they're just talking about polymorphism. So subtyping, uh, let's say and we, we, we a definition of it. Uh, so in a programming language theory, subtyping known as subtype polymorphism or inclusion polymorphism is a, uh, is a form of type polymorphism in which a subtype is a data type that is related to another data type, that is the super type. So by some notion of uh, substitution, substitutionality, meaning that program elements, typically if you have subroutines or functions written to operate on elements of the super type can also operate on elements of the subtype. So that, that is generally simply what you can just uh, talk about. Like if, if you've written functions, or methods that can be able to work on elements that are on a super type. If a class goes ahead and inherits that super type, that those functions can act can work the same way and operate the same way on elements in your in your uh, subclass. So if S is a subtype of T, the subtyping relation is often written as if by any chance you see this particular type of relationship written, it means this this one S is a subtype of T. So this the sign usually shows subtyping. So to mean any term, uh, any type term of type, like any type of S can be used, it can be safely used in a context where a term type of T is expected. So it means when it is like that, S being a substitute of T, any place where a type of T is used, that that type of T can be substituted with a type of S and things will work out fine and the behavior of the functionality should not change. So with that, the Liskov substitution principle is what, let's see examples of it. So uh, it was written by Barbara Liskov in 1988, 
And it says that functions that reference base classes must be able to use objects uh, of derived child classes without knowing it. So it is important for a programmer to notice that, unlike some, uh, like there are other four principles that you've looked at, uh, who's breaking it might result into bad code or something, but the work code will work. If you violate the list of principle or by violation of this principle, principle which most likely lead to buggy or difficult to maintain code or code that do not work. I think LISCOV is a bit uh, not easy to understand, but when you look at an example, uh, it will be now more clearer to be able to understand it. So let's say something with LISCOV substitution principle, it looks like if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, but needs batteries, you probably have the wrong abstraction. So the whatever functionality, how that function works, with, with if it is provided certain attributes in a superclass, if we go to the subclass and provide it with, this, with the attributes of the subclass, it should work the same. It should not be maybe work as or, or look like the way it does in the superclass. It should not, it should work like nothing has changed. So let's say, for example, let's look at, at, a, at, a, at a class here and try and, and understand it easier. So we have a class that we, we have called it transportation device. In our class, we have variables. We have declared a, a, string, a, a, a name of type string, and then a getter for the name and the setter for the name. We've clear, declared a variable, a, a double variable of type speed, uh, of a variable speed of type double, and then we've a getter for that speed and also a setter. And then we also have an engine Let's say we have somewhere a, type, a class called engine. So we have, we have created a, a variable engine that is of type class engine. And then we have a getter for that engine and then a setter for that engine. And then we also have another uh, class, uh, another function that we have said start engine. So for our transportation device, all we have done is that let, let's say we have specified the name of our transportation device, what is its speed, and then uh, the engine, and then a function to start the engine. So we have a, a class car that extends our transportation device. So we have no problem here because a car has an engine. So a car can be able to implement uh, all the methods in this class without any problem because it has an engine. So it will go ahead and start an engine. So there's no problem here. So a, class is a car is definitely a transportation device. And here we can see that it overrides the, the start engine method of its superclass without any problem, okay? So let's add another transportation device, but this time we add a bicycle. So a bicycle is a transportation device, but it doesn't have an engine. But remember on our superclass, we have a, a, a method start engine that is supposed to be overridden in our bicycle class. So we have a problem there. So everything isn't going as planned now. Yes, a bicycle is a transportation device. However, it does not have an engine and hence the method start engine cannot be implemented in our bicycle class. So these are kinds of problems that violation of the LISCOP substitution principle leads to. And they can most usually be recognized by a method that does nothing or even can't be implemented. So if you find that maybe uh, in your class, you have a method that if other classes that extend your class do nothing with that method, or they cannot even implement that method. So it means that there's something wrong, like you, the list of substitution principle has been violated. So the solution of this problem is a correct inheritance hierarchy. So you should have a way, a, a correct way in which attributes are being inherited. So, and in our case, we would solve the problem by differentiating classes of transportation devices into the transportation devices that have engines and then those ones that don't have engines. So even though a bicycle is a transportation device, it doesn't have an engine. So in this example, our division, our definition of transportation device is what was wrong. So it should not have an engine in our transportation device. So we can refactor now our our code so that you can not violate the least of transport uh, the, the least of principle by having our transportation uh, device class as follows. So we just have the name and the speed, because no matter what kind of transportation device we have, it will definitely have a name and it will definitely have a speed. And then we can now extend our transportation device now for our single, uh, our, our devices now, the ones that have engine and the ones that do not have engine. So you see here we have class devices without 
no engines, but it extends our transportation device. Uh, because even though our, our, our device has an engine or does not have an engine, it will still need to have a name and a speed. So, and in our device without engines, we have gone ahead and implemented our method, our start moving method. So this method applies to this particular device. And then what about for our devices that have engines? We go ahead and create another class for devices with engines, which will still extend our transportation device class. And then here we can now go ahead and implement our engine. And then we get the engine, we set the engine, and then we start the engine. So, so our car class now becomes more specialized. So our car, instead of it extending transportation device, it will only extend the devices with engines class. And from there, we can start our engine from our car class. And then our bicycle class is also in compliance with our list of substitution in principle because it extends a class in which it can be able to implement the methods from it. So remember from our devices without engine class, we had our, our, our method start moving. So when our bicycle class extends it, it can be able to over, override our method of start moving. So with that, it can it, it can be able to extend from a class that it can provide implementation for. So there is no point that we, we cannot sit there being confused like now what do we do with this method? It cannot be implemented in this class. So as you can see, it was a matter of simply uh, giving uh, appropriate responsibilities or or, uh, yeah, or methods to classes and having the correct hierarchy of inheritance. So as you can see in our uh, our solution, we created a class that can serve both uh, devices with engines and devices without engines. And then after creating that class, we created now a class that deals with devices with engines and one that doesn't that deals with devices without engines. But both of these classes extended from the transportation device. So that is, that was our first hierarchy of uh, of inheritance. So they extended from the transportation device, and then we came and now created our individual car classes and bicycle classes. And now these one these now form our second layer of extension. So these ones now. They are uh, second layer of inheritance, sorry. So this was now they inherit from the devices with engine class or devices without engine class. So having that knowledge of knowing how we can be able to break down our inheritance so that we don't break things or we don't have methods that do nothing in our classes, that way we can be able to uh, implement the least cause substitution principle. So object-oriented languages such as Java are very, very powerful and offer you as a developer a tremendous amount of flexibility. So you can either misuse or abuse any language when it comes to that. So if you're writing objects which extend classes but fails the ISR test, you're likely violating the Liskov uh, principle. So uh, the ISR test, remember, um, we, it's, it's one that shows the relationship between uh, a, a parent class and, and, and maybe an object class. Like for example here, uh, if, if this one, let's say we can say, is a, is a car a device with engine? Yes. Is a bicycle a device with engine? No. Let's say for example, and you see we, uh, the, the, the bicycle doesn't belong here, so that one is correct. And here we can say, is a bicycle uh, a device without engine? Yes. So it doesn't it doesn't necessarily fail by 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 failing with just me it doesn't fail whatever has been uh, has been implemented in the class that it inherits from. So you see here, a bicycle can be able to implement start moving without any problem and it will not fail because it's actually uh, created to start moving. So we have not violated anything there. And a bicycle is actually, we can be able to calculate its speed and we can be able to calculate it, we can be able to give it a name. So it hasn't failed that. But you know, initially when we had the transportation device for the bicycle, remember, it was failing whereby it could not be able to start engine. So it, it, it was failing when it came to this method. It cannot be able to implement that method because it doesn't have that capability. So in the event that we find that in our class, there are there are methods that you cannot be able to implement because we don't have that capability to do that, then most likely we have failed the Liskov substitution principle. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think for the list of one, it's, it's a bit difficult to get, but I think with practice and trying to look at different resources, someone you can be able to get what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, so any questions on the list of substitution principle? Any questions on that before we move to the next principle? So after that, we can go to the interface segregation principle. So uh, this one is just I like a question. The blue okay. Hand is okay. Um, hi. Hi. So um, I was I understood this um, list of substitution principle that it kind of moved from the super class to the subclass, right? It followed yeah. the hierarchy from top to bottom. But yeah. I was when I say substitution, I was thinking it will also be able to move from bottom up. So especially the analogy you gave about the dog and then the other child, like the subclass that has a battery. So yeah. how can we say um, the subclass can represent the superclass? Or am I understanding it wrongly? Yeah, you know, it's right. The subclass can represent the superclass in the way it is implementing its methods. Let's say in the in the in the your bicycle principle, remember? So let's okay. follow now from uh, from our subclass as we go up, okay? Okay. So we have our bicycle class and it it extended the devices without engines. So we go ahead, we, we go and check. We are implementing the start moving principle. So can our bicycle start moving? Yes, it can. So here on the level of bicycle extending the devices without engines, then our subclass can be able to do what its superclass wanted it to do. Okay. Okay. Then let's move to the devices without engines. So our devices without en engines, it, it extended uh, the transportation device, okay? And by it extending the transportation device, remember we also said a child can go ahead and have their own properties. Apart from them having the properties of the parents, they can go ahead and implement their own properties. So the transportation device did not have the start moving, uh, did not have the start moving method. It only had uh, the method to get and set speed, and then they want to get and set the name, the getters and setters only. But our child had the freedom of implementing their own method. So this child, the devices without engine, it went ahead and implemented the method of start moving. But it has not violated its parents because it's allowed to implement its own methods. And also, can, when you check devices without engines, do they have a name? And can they implement a name? Yes. Do they have a speed and can they be, be, can they be, be able to implement a speed? They can. So these two, the, the getters and setters have not been implemented in this because as we know, uh, they use the classes constructor to be able to set whatever it's passed to them. So we actually do not have to go ahead and implement them here. So when you are moving even from the child to the parent, the child is fulfilling, let's say, let's say fulfill, let's use that word, what the parent wants it to, if it chooses to, and also it can it has its own uh, properties also. If you go to the other one, the car class also, as you can see, um, it's, it's implementing the start engine. When you look at its parent, the devices without engine, it's specified that it has this start engine method. So is the, is the child implementing that method? Yes, our child is also implementing the start engine method. And as you can see also here, we also had the freedom of implementing our own things. So this class was able to go ahead and even create a type of uh, 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 an engine of type, uh, a variable engine of type class engine. And then it also went ahead and had its own getters and setters. So it also took the freedom of being a subclass and doing its own things and properties. And then it being an extension or it inheriting from the transportation device, we go and say, so if a device with engine has a name, yes. Does it have a speed? Yes. So it also hasn't violated whatever its parent, uh, the, 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 the parent uh, class wanted. So even from coming from the bottom going up, we, we, we as we check, we still haven't violated whatever 
we, we, we were supposed to achieve by our implementation. Okay. So, yeah, so I don't, is that uh, clear, the explanation? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's okay. I just have to look at more examples and I think yeah. Later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the Liskov substitution principle is the trickiest amongst these principles. Yeah. So I think with that one you can go and even check on more examples. Yeah. Any other question? <laughs> okay. So we go to the interface segregation principle. This one. Uh, the single responsibility, remember it applied to classes when we are looking at the first uh, principle. The interface segregation principle is more or less like the single responsibility one, only that here we are talking about principle. So, uh, sorry, we are talking about interfaces. For the single responsibility, we are talking about classes, like don't make God classes, um, ensure that your class does as, as a, uh, one function or a single responsibility. So we are just trying to achieve the same with interfaces. So interface, they form a core part of the Java programming language, and they are extensively used in enterprise applications to achieve abstraction and to support multiple inheritance. Because as you saw, you cannot be able to inherit for multiple classes, but you can be able to do the same for interfaces. So uh, as a programmer, you, mu you must have written a large number of interfaces. But the critical question is, have you written them while keeping design principles in mind? So. Uh, so a design principle to follow while writing an interface is the interface segregation principle. So it was first used by Robert C. Martin while he was consulting for Xerox, which he mentions in his uh, 2002 book, Agile Software Development, Principles, Patterns, and Practices. So the principle states that clients should not be forced to depend on methods that, do not, that they do not use. So here the term clients refers to the implementing classes of an interface. So... Remember when we were, we, were intro, we were talking about interfaces during our former introduction, we said that the methods that you provide in your interface, any class that is going to implement your interface has to provide implementation for all the methods. So can you imagine if your interface has a hundred methods, it means that all the classes that are going to implement that interface, they have to provide implementation for all those 100 methods, whether they are using them or not. So that kind of tells you that your interface should at least have methods that a, client, uh, that, that, that a class would use and nothing more. Should not just add any methods to your, to, your, to your interface. So what the interface aggregation principle says is that your interface should not be bloated with methods that implementing classes don't require. So for such interface, they are, also, they are called FAT interfaces. So implementing classes are, necess are necessarily being forced to provide implementation. So that is what I was telling you. You might find some code and you see that like there's some dummy or empty methods in that code. So they, these dummy or empty methods, they have just been provided because someone has implemented an interface and they have to provide implementation for such methods. So they actually don't need these methods, but they are forced to implement dummy dummy data or dummy uh, um dummy methods for those interfaces. So in addition, the implementing classes are subject to change when the interface changes. Remember, when in, you add anything to the interface, let's say you have added a new method to that interface, it will mean the classes that are implementing it also have to go ahead and implement the method that you've added to your interface. So in addition of a method or change to a method signature requires modifying all the implementation classes, even if some of them don't use the method. So if let's say you, you implemented a method in your interface and then let's say it was uh, taking one parameter and then in the future you come and modify that method and say, let's say it takes two parameters now, it will mean that all the classes that are implementing that interface have to change their method signature to take maybe the, the two parameters. And this means classes that use that method and those that don't. So we can imagine for classes that don't use that method, it's just a lot of unnecessary work. So the interface segregation principle advocates segregation of, of a fat interface into smaller uh, and highly cohesive interfaces known as role interfaces. So you try and, 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 and see what do you want to achieve with your interface? And then confined to that role, you just provide methods that achieve that small role that you want to. That is one interface. So you can have as many interfaces as you want. So just make them applicable to a particular role. So each role interfaces declares one or more methods for specific behavior. So you can have just one or more methods that achieve a particular behavior and then your 
interface is done. Go ahead, you can you have the freedom of of writing as many interfaces as you want. So just make them specific to a particular behavior. So you see that's class instead of, instead of me going ahead and implementing a fat interface that maybe has a 90 60% of methods that I need and then 40% of the ones that I don't need, I can actually inherit from inherit um I can actually, sorry, implement, let's say, more than one interfaces that just have the roles or the methods that I need. So instead of implementing one FAT interface, you can implement those role interfaces uh, whose method you are relevant to you. So if I need methods from five interfaces, I have the freedom of going ahead and uh, implementing those five interfaces instead of going ahead and implementing just one FAT interface that I majority of the methods I will not use. So we should have that uh, in mind when we are creating our interfaces. So let's look at an example where we have uh, the, the interface aggregation principle has been violated. So we are considering the requirement of an application that builds different types of toys. So let's say we have an application that builds toys. So each toy has a price and a color. So some toys such as a toy car or a train can move. That is an additional property to a toy, while some toys such as a toy plane can both move and also fly. So we go ahead and create an interface that defines the behavior of toys in this. So we have our interface, so we have our method set price, we have a method set color, we have a method move, and we have a method fly. So that is our toy, uh, our toy interface. So a class that represents a toy plane can implement that interface and provide implementations for all the interface methods, but imagine a class that represents a toy house. So we do not, a toy house doesn't move, it doesn't fly. So we actually, there's so, there, there are many methods that we will just provide dummy data for those methods and we actually don't need them. So because we are implement, we, we are implementing the toy, this toy interface, and we need to provide implementation for all these methods, it means our toy house class will have to be like this. So we will set the price, we'll set the color, but we have move and fly. We will just provide empty uh, functions for them. We will provide empty methods for them. So that is what we mean. So as you can see in the code, Toyhouse needs to provide implementation for move and fly methods, and it does not require them. So these are violation of the interface segregation principle. So such violations affect code readability because can you imagine you're a programmer uh, programming somewhere and you're trying to program for the toy house and then you have an autocomplete uh, for moves and you, you wonder why is this toy moving or why is this toy flying or something like that. So even for just um, a readability and flow, we need to consider such things. So violation of the interface aggregation principle also leads to violation of the uh, complementary open closed principle. So as an example, consider that the toy interface is modified to include maybe a walk method to accommodate toy robots. So as a result, it will mean we need to modify all the existing toy implementation classes to include the walk method, even if maybe our toys doesn't our toy doesn't work but we need to provide that work method because we have it has been added to the interface that we are implementing from so in fact the toy implementation classes will never be closed for modification because every time we will need a new behavior for a toy it will mean it will be added to our our fat interface which is our our toy interface so it will mean it will be open for modification forever as long as we are producing toys so if we follow the interface aggregation principle, we will do the following. So the following interface aggregation principle, you can address the main problem of the toy building application, whereby the toy interface is forcing clients to depend on methods that they do not use. So we are forced to implement methods that we don't even use. So the solution is we can segregate the toy interface into multiple role interfaces. So each for a specific behavior. So we, we can segregate our, int, our toy interface so that our application, we can have now three interfaces. We have a toy interface that maybe has the price because all interfaces, uh, all the toys, sorry, will have a price and maybe the color. And then we have a movable interface that will be implemented the toys that move and then a flyable interface that will be implemented by, by toys that fly. And then we have the freedom. Let's say if you have a, a, a toy that can move and fly, that toy can implement both the movable and the flyable interface without any, any issues. So 
this is how it will look like for our toy interface. We just have the set price and the scalar methods only. For our movable, we have the method moves. And then for a flyable, you have the method fly. So we at least have now three uh, role interfaces for our interface. So in the examples above, we first wrote the toy interface with the set price and the set color methods, as all toys will have a price and color. And then all toy implementation classes can implement the toy interface without any issue. Then we wrote the movable and the flyable interface to represent the moving and the flying behavior in toys. So, um, so we can now let's write the implementation classes. So if we have a toy house, we have no problem. For a toy house, we only need a color and a prize. So what we need is that we will just implement the toy interface. So we have, we set the prize, we set the color, and then we go ahead, maybe we, 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 we output the price and color for our toy. So our toy house, we just implement the toy interface only. For our car, uh, our, our toy car, remember we said our, our toy car moves, so it can implement the movable, the, the toy uh, interface and the movable interface. So for the toy interface, it will provide us with the uh, ability to, to set the price and the color of our toy. And then the movable interface will provide us with the ability to set the, uh, the to implement the move method. So we go and implement that. So our toy car is complete without any problems. Then if we have our plane, a toy plane, our toy plane can go ahead and implement the three interfaces. It can implement the toy, the movable, and the flyable. So go ahead, it can go ahead and set the price and the color, and then set the void move, uh, the, the method move, and tell us how the toy plane will move, and then also set the method for fly. So with this way, all our toys, all our, our, our classes are not forced to implement methods that they do not need. So if just needs the method in the toy interface, it will only implement that. If needs the methods, the movable interface and the toy interface, it will only implement those two. If it needs all the methods, it will implement all those three methods. So in that way, we have segregated our interfaces into roles. So as you can see, the implementation class now implements only those interfaces that are we are in they are interested in. So they do not have to, they don't have unnecessary clutters and they are more readable and they are lesser prone to modifications due to changes in the interface or the methods. So, uh, so let's say if we write a class uh, that is used to uh, build, uh, to build object, uh, to build the toys or something like that. So if you go ahead and say uh, toy builder, if you are building the toy house, it will just go ahead and set the price and the color only. If it is building the car, the toy car, it will go ahead and set the price, the color, and say, implement the method and um, make it move. It is, if it is building the plane, it will set the price, the color, make it move, and make the plane fly. So it, you see, it, even when we are doing the actual implementation of setting uh, issues and everything with our toy class, it, we have code that is also clean. It is separated into different actions, so it's not confusing. We can know what we are dealing with upright. So uh, the toy builder class has three static methods to create objects of the uh, toy class. So that is OK. So if you go ahead and write, uh, if you wrote the above code and you go ahead uh, and went ahead and wrote tests for it, the tests are supposed now to pass. Because when you have your toy house and then uh, you the toy builder house, um, you can be able to, these tests are not supposed to pass because they can be able to access whatever they want from the interfaces that they, they need. So uh, so that is how we can be able to segregate our interfaces. So as, as a conclusion, both, both the interface segregation principle and the single responsibility principle have the same goal, that ensuring you have small focus and highly cohesive software components. So the difference is that the single responsibility principle is concerned with classes, while the interface segregation principle is concerned with interfaces. So interface segregation principle is easy to understand and simple to follow. So, but identifying the distinct interfaces can sometimes be a challenge as careful considerations are required to avoid uh, proliferation or, or of interfaces. So you need to sit down, maybe try and, and see how you can be able to group your interfaces into roles 
and then go ahead and segregate them that way. So while writing an interface, consider the possibility of implementation classes having different set of behaviors. And if so, segregate the interfaces into multiple interfaces, each having a specific role. So when you have your interface, you try and ask yourself, so if a class is going to implement this um, interface of mine, will they need to, will, will they need to maybe implement whatever I've given this interface and maybe they will not need some of them or the others that we need all of them, the others that we need just part of them. So if you have that in mind, you can think of maybe trying to separate your interfaces in terms of roles. So you think of the behavior of your classes and then separate your interfaces according to those behaviors that you that you foresee being there in your classes. So I think with that we are done with the um, interface segregation principle. So any any question on that? Any question on that? OK. If there's no question, we can now go to our last um, principle, which is the dependency inversion principle. So as, as a programmer, not even a Java programmer only, a programmer in all the other languages, you've mostly had, mainly had about code coupling, and you've been told to avoid tightly coupled uh, code. So um, so the ignorance of writing good code is the main reason why we end up with uh, tightly coupled code in application. Uh, so for example, creating an object of a class using the new operator like what we've been seeing results in a class being tightly coupled to another class. So you find that if you write an object of a class, the class that you've written the object in is connected to that other class. So it means changes on that other class will definitely directly affect your class. So such tight couplings between classes um, they may appear harmless and does not uh, is not disruptive on small codes, but when you move to enterprise application, you find that tightly coupled code can lead to serious adverse consequences. So when one class knows ex uh, explicitly about the design and implementation of another class, so changes to one class they, it raises the risk of breaking the other class. So uh, your class should not overly depend on another class because it means that if changes happen to the other class. It most likely your class will be affected and it, may, it might even lead to your class breaking. So if this is a big application and maybe it's serving a lot of things, it will mean that there's some somewhere in the, there will be a failure in your application somewhere if such changes occur. Also, also changes can have rippling effect in your application and to make your application fragile. So it means that your application has so many points of, 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 of failure, like there's so many places in which your application can fail because if it's dependent on so many classes, like classes depends on depend on each other, the failure points are many. So to avoid such problems, uh, we should write good code. Now that by good code, you mean they should be loosely coupled. Dependence, interdependence should be. Uh, kept minimal. And to support this now, we turn into the dependency inversion principle. So uh, Robert C. Martin was um, first postulated the dependency inversion principle, and it was published in 1996. The principle states that A, high-level modules should not depend on low-level modules. Both should depend on abstractions. So if you want to uh, provide a relationship between a high level module and a low level module, they should relate or depend on each other through an abstraction. And abstractions, as we have seen, it can be an abstract class or an interface. So both your modules should depend on an interface. And then abstraction should not depend on details. Details should depend on abstractions. So uh, like, for example, your interface and, and everything, they should not uh, depend on the lower uh, programming details or anything. Let your for for example whatever you set or whatever you're doing lowly on your low level or your high level classes or anything your interface should not depend on the results of whatever you're doing uh instead the the calculations for example that you're doing on your low level your, or, or, or on your class it, it is the one that should now de depend on your abstraction it should depend on your interface or something like that so so here it's like when you the the interface is what is connecting everything, but it the interface itself should not depend on anything. Everything else should depend on it, but it should, the it it should not be dependent on anything on 
whatever you're doing to calculate or your lower level abstractions or calculations. So conventional applications architecture, they follow a top-down design approach where a high-level problem, as we know, is broken down into smaller parts. So in other words, the high-level design is de described in terms of the smaller parts. So this, this results in high-level modules they get, that get written and they depend um, directly on the smaller level modules. Because remember, for us to come up with the high-level modules, we, we designed our smaller levels and then we, uh, we built them to become our high-level modules. So this type of design makes us end up with a highly dependent system where our high level depends on our lower level. So what de dependency inversion, as you have said, we are trying to invert this dependency. So instead of a high level module depending on a low level module, both of them should depend on an abstraction. So let's see the figure below. So here we have a package. So without dependency inversion, we have package A that has an object A, and then we have package B that had a, has an object B. So package A references object B directly. So this means that our object here A is dependent on our object B. So if anything changes on this, our A will break. But with uh, dependency inversion, inversion, what we're saying is we introduce an interface. This is our abstraction. So our the, the abstraction can be from a package, can be housed, let's say, in package A. So our object A now refers to our abstraction. And our object B inherits from our abstraction. So you see the relationship between our these two objects of ours now goes through an interface or an abstraction here. So if anything happens to any of these, our abstraction will still stand. It will mean that it, it will not directly affect. So if uh, if B goes down or it changes, A doesn't directly depend on B. It depends on our interface. So our interface now will still be up and maybe there's a way in which you can be able to know that something has gone wrong. So I think let's look at um, uh, explanation. So in the figure above, without dependency, uh, without the dependency, de dependency inversion principle, object A in package A refers to object B in package B. So with the dependency inversion principle, an interface A is introduced an, as an abstraction in package A. So object A now refers to the interface and object B inherits from the interface. So what the principle has done is object A and object B now depend on an interface. So this is the abstraction, the interface is the abstraction. So it inverted the dependency that existed from object A to object B into object B, B being dependent on the abstraction, that is the interface. So that is generally what we're just doing. We're just cutting down direct uh, dependencies into, uh, into uh, objects depending on abstraction. So uh, before we write code that follows the dependency inversion principle, let's examine uh, a, a typical violation of uh, dependency inversion principle. So this is what we are trying to say. Like when you're talking about dependency inversion principle, would you solder a, a, a lamp directly into, an, into the electrical wiring on a wall? No, you cannot be able to, because that we don't want to give that uh, permanence or that permanent dependence on one object to another. So we cannot be able to do that. So that is why we can, you, you go ahead and come up with a switch. So this switch means is that we can be able to remove that uh, socket and plug in something else. And then if let's say plug in a lamp tomorrow, we want to plug in um, an AC, we can remove that and plug something else. So that gives us the freedom of, because we are depending on an abstraction, we can always inherit from an interface from different places. We actually are not tied to a particular class. So this is a bad example of, uh, of the dependency inversion principle. So these are violations. So consider the example of an electrical switch that turns a light, uh, a light bulb on and off. So we can model this requirement by creating two classes. You can create an electrical switch class and a light bulb class. So we write, a light bulb class that has a method, a void method that is used to turn on, and then another method that is used to turn off our light bulb. So that is our light bulb class. And then we, uh, in the light bulb class above, as you've said, you've written two methods, the turn on and the turn off methods to turn the bulb on and off. Then we'll write our electrical switch class. So in our electrical switch class, we are referring to our light bulb class. 
and then we we create another uh, a, a variable called on which is of type boolean and then we come and this is our constructor so in our constructor the constructor of our class we just set our light bulb and then we say we we we, we set our light bulb into we start with it, it it being on we say it's false so we start with it being off and then uh we we are providing implementation for our our boolean so we have a method a boolean method that is called is on and then we return whatever we have is our own method so this method is just used to whether we check uh, whether we turn our bulb on and off and then we have another method let's say we we call it press and then we check whether it is on so what we are just doing here is that we are checking we check if uh, if is our light bulb um is is it turned off yeah so we we if it is turned off we say it is our own is false and then if our our bulb is on we just say our own is true so this is just uh, we just say an implementation of our electrical switch so in that example we wrote the electrical switch class with a field referencing to the light bulb so in the constructor we created a light bulb object and assigned it to the field then we wrote an is on method that returns the state of our electrical switch as a boolean value so in the press method based on the state we called the turn on or turn off depending on whether our light bulb is on or off so our switch is now ready for use to turn on and off the bulb but the uh, the mistake we did is apparent so our high level electrical switch class is directly dependent on the low level light bulb class so if we use this code the light bulb class is hard coded in the electrical switch class as you've seen but a switch should be should not be tied to a bulb so it should be able to you can you should be able to use a switch to either turn on other appliances it should it should, it should not just be used to turn on a light bulb so uh, you can be able to use a switch to turn on other devices say a fan an ac the entire lighting system of a lighting system of an amusement park and all that so a switch should not be tied to one particular uh, appliance it should be shall have the freedom to be used by any other appliance so now imagine the modification will require uh, in the electrical power switch class each time we add a new appliance or a device so it means we'll be having to go and hard coding that particular new device on this electrical power switch class so we can conclude that our design is flawed and we need to revisit it by following the, the, the dependency inversion principle whereby we are supposed to introduce now a layer of abstraction. So uh, when you follow the dependency inversion principle, to, uh, we need an abstraction but that both the electrical power switch and the light bulb uh, classes will depend on. But before creating it, let's create an interface for switches. So, uh, so what what is the our uh, point of our switch? We just check. We have our switch uh, interface switch uh, that we check is it on. We we have two methods for the switch. One for checking it is if it is on, and one for pressing it. So our interface has these two methods. So we wrote an interface for switches with the is on and press methods. So this interface will give us the flexibility to plug in other types of switches. Say we can be able to plug in a remote control switch later on if required, because provided they fulfill these two methods, like provided our appliance can be checked if it is on and then we can press it to switch it on or off, then we can be able to inherit from our switch interface. So then next we'll write the abstraction in the form of an interface which we will call switchable now. So in our abstraction, we write uh, an interface that we call switchable. And that interface, we just provide our two methods of turning on and off. So this interface is the one that now we actually do the actual work of whether we call it when we want to turn our switch on, or uh, and we also call it maybe when we want to start, turn our switch off. So it just provided the functionality of switching on and off. So in the exa example above, we wrote the switchable interface with the turn on and off methods. From, so from now on, any switchable device in the application can implement this switchable interface and provide their own functionality. So we can, provided our device is switchable, it can be able to, uh, uh, it can be able to implement switchable. And then on the turn on, it can decide or 
uh, or write an implementation how it is turned on and on the turn off it can write an implementation how it is turned off because you can argue and say the way maybe we turn on an ac is not the same way we we, we turn on as another particular device or something like that so switchable gives you that freedom you can go and implement how you you turn on your devices in your particular application so with that with those two classes with those two interfaces in place now our electrical power switch class we also uh, depend on this interface as shown below. So when you go to our electrical power switch, we implement the switch class. Remember the switch class, this one, that has the is on end and the press method. And then we come and also have another, uh, another variable that is of the type switchable. This interface of whether checking if it is the, the properties, whether it is uh, the, on and off for our switchable device. So uh, from that, so our our uh, our what is called our constructor is going to implement our switchable, and then we 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 say if our client is on, we check if it is on or off. So our class remains to like almost the same as it was before, only that now now we are implementing on switch, and then our constructor is now uh, uh, being provided with the switchable, setting the switchable client. So the other methods just stay the same, whether we are checking if it is we are pressing on or or off. So here, what we are doing is, in the electrical power switch class, we implemented the switch interface and referred to the switchable interface instead of any concrete class in the field. So remember, initially, here, instead of switchable, we were had coding the light bulb logic. So we are saying the light bulb logic should do this there here on this here instead of switchable. So instead of doing that right now here, we have we are referring to an interface that ju that just checks if our device how is our device switchable and then it provides the implementation of how to be able to go ahead and do that. So that is why we are saying in the electrical power uh, class we implemented the switch. Uh, interface and refer to the switchable interface instead of any concrete class in a field. So we then called the turn on and off methods on the interface. Yeah. The turn on and off, because remember the turn on and off are on our switchable class. So we came where uh, we go ahead and we called the turn on and turn off here for our uh, in our class, in our electrical power switch class. Which, in, which at runtime will get invoked on the object passed to the constructor. Now we can add the low level now switchable classes without worrying about modifying the electrical power class. So when we, wa we want to add our light bulb, so our light bulb will implement the switchable class. And remember now, the, uh, as we were talking about the hierarchy of inheritance, light bulb is implementing the switchable while switchable is being referred to by the electrical power switch. So our electrical power switch class will always uh, the light bulb will always have access to our electrical power switch. So when we implement light bulb, we can always say it will implement switchable and then we define how we want to turn on and turn off our light bulb. So if in by any chance tomorrow we want to add a fan, so all we have to do is just tell our fan to implement switchable. And our electrical uh, switch class will always have reference to our fan. It will always have reference to our light bulb and they're not hard coded in it. So in both the light bulb and, and fan classes that we wrote, we implemented the switchable interface to provide their own functionality for turning on and off. So while writing the classes, keep the switchable interface in a different package from the low, the low level electrical device classes. So by doing so, we make our intentions clear. So we want the low level classes to depend inversely on our abstraction. So here we, we are just saying that for the light bulb, the fan, or whichever other devices that you might ever want to add, they will all be dependent on the switchable class, this one, which in turn is being invoked by our electrical power class, now, like the class that now it's supposed to aggregate all these things together. So this will also help us later uh, to decide to release if for example tomorrow you decide to release the high level package as a public api that other application can use for their devices so tomorrow you can decide to make this electrical power switch as, as an api and other people can be able to use and implement it and it means we will not have exposed the light bulb or the fan as uh, switch to 
to the public because at least they have they are implementing the suitable uh, interface and are, are not directly hard coded on that particular class. So where if you, for example you want to write a test for it, you write write test on the let's say electrical power switch test. Um, you create a, a bulb under the switchable interface, and then um, also under the switch interface, you can also create a bulb power switch, and then you you check and see if your press method works or not. Yeah, so this is just on the test, and then the test is supposed to pass because um, generally all your code is depending on the abstraction that is the interface, and the interface provides all the methods that you need to run. Yeah. So, um, so the, the the dependency inversion is just mostly like a a combination of the open closed principle and the list of substitution principle. Yeah. So if the, the if you take the two of them, you now combine them together, they kind of give you the dependency inversion principles. So it comes with the overhead of writing additional code because, as you can see, you have to write additional code for your abstraction that is your interfaces and then how you are referring to those interfaces so that that will mean you will be writing more code uh, but the advantages that you provide they outweigh the extra effort so that means that in future if you just want to add something all you need to do is that you just be referring still referring to the abstraction and you will not be changing code from the main class or you'll not be doing any changes in the main class so from therefore from now on, whenever you start writing code, you should always consider the possibility of dependencies breaking your code. And if so, you should add abstractions to make your code resilient to changes. So you should think like if tomorrow we come and add a future or a feature or we want to do any change, what will the impact be? Will my functionality change? Will I need to go to the code and start hard coding things? So if that is the answer, then it means that maybe you need to introduce a layer of abstraction. So with that, we are done with the solid, uh, the solid principles and mostly done with the whole issue of scalability. So as you've seen, when we are going through those principles, we are just thinking of the future. Well, let's say if I'm writing this code right now, will people in the future be able to add content to it? Will people in the future be able to do anything to it? So this is it. So with that in mind and that in picture, I think it's clear like for a software, engineer when you're writing your code uh in terms of scalability i know we ask ourselves now how do i make this code scalable and all that so these are the ways in which you can be able to do that like you can make your classes have just a single responsibility you can have the open closed principle the list of substitution principle whenever you can like in your application when you're writing it whenever you can be able to apply the solid principle apply them because they make now your code easy to extend in future. So that means you as the programmer have contributed to making your the application more scalable. Yeah. So um, so it, it is necessary for programmers to follow the solid principles in object-oriented programming. So or even in your programming practices. So this makes it easier. As you can see, your code will be more readable. You you thoroughly test your code and then you also write maintainable code because someone else will be able to understand uh, your code and the flow of things. So they are valuable tools to know the solid principles. So you should have them in your toolbox. So and then you should keep at the back of your mind whenever you're designing your next feature or your next application. Uh, I think with that, any questions on the um, on the last principles that um, dependency inversion principles and also generally on now the whole topic because we are done with the solid principles and whatever we have gone through today. So I'm open for any questions that now you may have or you may you may want need to be answered. Mm. Kindly, uh, I can't understand the dependency code. Uh, so, can uh, make simplifying for this? 
Okay. Which which code can't you understand? Dependency. The, the last the, the last example. Okay, the dependency inversion one. Uh, the light and the any. Okay. I can I can't apply uh, them for another examples. Yani it's very difficult to uh, uh, to understand how to apply them for other examples. Okay. Is there any tools uh, can help us in this? Mm, I think I can share. I'll share this. Um, presentation and I have given the resources at the end of the presentation that you can be able to go and look at and maybe try and read on your own that can help you in understanding the um, the principles more. I think maybe that can be a good solution. Um, because at the end here I've provided the the resources that you can be able to, to go and go through. These ones, especially the principles of object-oriented design, they help, they pass through all the, the solid principles and how you can be able to apply them. And actually this is where I even got the examples that you can use in coding. So I think maybe I will share the resources. Thank you so much, Nassim. There's a question. Dorothy asks, are these solid principles just used for OOP? I think they should be open source or something. Oh, yeah, object oriented principles. Yeah. Yeah. So they they mostly I can say they mostly apply for object oriented because as you have seen, they they touch on the on the um, principles of inheritance and the principles of polymorphism and everything. So if maybe you have a language that doesn't uh, maybe you're using a language that doesn't use inheritance that doesn't apply polymorphism and all that, then it would be difficult to apply them. Uh, because as you can see, they are based on the object-oriented principles. Like most of them, as you've seen, we leveraged on abstraction, we've re leveraged on uh, inheritance, or polymorphism and all that. So if the language that you're using doesn't apply those, then it will be difficult for you to apply the solid principles because they are dependent on, such, on the object-oriented principles. So they are kind of tied to the object-oriented uh, programming languages. Um, I think go ahead and ask a question. Okay, so um, just to touch on what she just said now, it brought me back to an idea that I've been toiling with for a very long time. For example, JavaScript um, language and Python language, these languages fundamentally when you start learning it, you did not start with OOP, right? Yeah. It's towards the end that you now start seeing OOP aspects of those languages. So how can we like use OOP in such languages? Mm -hmm. I think um, there are principles. Uh, my answer to that would it can be biased, but I think on my in my own opinion, you can you can think of principles that generally maybe they're not tied to object oriented principles i can think of you can think of something like the single responsibility that one you can actually apply it in a in a language that is not necessarily object oriented because if for example if you're creating classes and these classes have certain functionality in them so you can restrict yourself to the single responsibility uh, uh, aspect of the principles so i think the way i would approach it is just to look at what i have in place like for the language that i have and the principles that i have and then i try and think now what can i be able to apply here that uh, can work for for my particular situation or for my particular language and what uh, cannot work then for the ones that it can work then you can start applying them because I think of uh, uh, for the single responsibility and also for the interface segregation, I think these are things that you can be able to apply in languages that leverage on the use of classes and interfaces. Um, so I, I think that can be maybe on preference, uh, but yeah, but you can yeah, try and that's see really what you can apply. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, Nassemda. 
Um, please, could you drop in the chat how the they will be able to reach you after now? What the okay. prefer of reach on social media? Thank you very much for such a wonderful delivery. Um, I want to call up my colleague Chigozi Paul to just run through some announcements. Okay. Yeah. Chigozi. Hi, Joy. Good afternoon, Joy. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to our amazing facilitator. I had such an amazing time. I learned so many things. Even though I'm, I, I don't have any foundation in software development. I was struggling a bit, but I could follow. And I'm, I'm so thankful. Thank you for honoring our invitation. Okay, no problem. All right. Okay, so um, I'm going to be posting our social media handles in the chat session. Joy has posted it previously, but I'm posting it again so it's easy to locate. I know that we've learned a lot of amazing things. Please share or share some of the nuggets you learned today on social media using the hashtag WT Masterclass. Also follow us on social media and let people know that we have amazing programs lined up for them and they are all free. For instance, our open day is coming up on the 11th of November. I don't know, for those of you following us on our social media, you would have been seeing some um, information as regards it. It promises to be an insightful time. I'll post the link to that. And applications for our bootcamp just closed. But that doesn't mean that you can still not, you know, we have two more courts of the bootcamp before the year runs out. Just follow up on our social, follow us on our social media, turn on notifications so you can stay updated with our information and be up to date with all the programs we are having. Also, our Digital for All Challenge is currently ongoing. It's an opportunity organized by Tech for Dev in partnership with Microsoft to inspire people to acquire digital skills. Not only do you get certifications as you learn, but you then also qualify for um, the Digital for All Challenge where you can win up to 3.5 million era. All you have to do is to register on the Digital for All um, platform and start learning. And as you learn, you post your certificate online so people can see what you are, what you are, what you've been um, learning so far. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for showing up today. Thank you. Have an amazing day. Over to you, Joy. Thank you so much, Igozi. And on that note. Hi, Joy. Um, I don't know if you are speaking, but I can't hear you. Yeah, I think we, oh, wow. we lost you. I was you. speaking. Yeah, I was speaking <laughs> on this one. Okay, good If you registered for Core 3 Bootcamp, um, the orientation holds on Tuesday and Wednesday. So look out for the email from us, the email from the beauty bootcamp at techfordev.com. And then the fourth court of our bootcamp, we're going to have another bootcamp. The bootcamps are two weeks introductory. Um, training that will just help you build a foundation, right, in either of our five learning tracks. So help with comes for those that are interested in software development, product design, data science, cybersecurity, and um, yeah, data science as well as security. So in, in case you are actually interested in any of these learning tracks, you can gain more, it's a longer time to learn, more like our master classes. Our master classes are just, um, you know, a shorter, take shorter durations that we can't Program. So we have another masterclass this month again on product design. So if you know anyone that's a product designer, just tell them to follow us on social media for these updates. Um, well done to you all. Thank you for staying on the call. Special thanks to Faustin. Faustin, you're such a wonderful person. At the point, I was like, no, Faustin's not going to get tired, right? She kept on firing <laughs> and firing and firing. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. For volunteering your time with us, we really appreciate. I'm sure the girls will connect after now. Send in a link to the recording, and we'll also receive the material from Faustine and send to your email. So look out for the list 
We'll also be uploading this video on social media. Once we upload, we'll send a link to you. Please, you can watch it over and over again um, for the information. Like, if you still want to catch up, for those of you who might have lost it at some point, well done to you all and have a beautiful day. Enjoy your weekend too. <laughs> okay. Thank you too. Thank you also for being an awesome audience. Uh, I hope you'll meet on these trips uh, on, online again. And thank you for organizing this masterclass. I also learned a lot today. <laughs>